All right. Welcome, everybody, to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's exciting debate on the millennium. I am thrilled to have Dr. Sam Frost and Phelan McFallon here with me to debate this topic. Dr. Sam Frost takes the all-millennial view, and Phelan takes the pre-millennial view for this debate. Gentlemen, I appreciate the time that you've given to us for tonight's event. I know how busy you both are. And so, gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, well, we're just going to waste no time. We're going to get right into it. Uh, We do have a formal debate. And so we're going to have 15-minute openings, (laughs) eight-minute rebuttals, a 50-minute discussion, which we've got broken up into two rounds, 25 minutes each. Then real quick closing statements, about three minutes each, just to wrap up your thoughts and points. And then we'll get through as many audience questions as we as we can. So Dr. Sam Frost, we're going to hand it over to you, my brother. Whenever you're ready, you've got 15 minutes for an opening statement. Go ahead. All righty. Um, well, in the dealing with John's apocalypse, my first point would be we find constant allusions or direct quotations of the Hebrew Bible. Um, that's in chapter 20, we should expect to find allusions to the prophets. So my, it's my contention, contention that John's vision here, what he saw and heard directly from the spirit to angels is what he wrote, is uh, what he's offering us as a revelation, is a um, what we see in Isaiah 24 through 28. This block of work in Isaiah has long been called Isaiah's Uh, little apocalypse the reference for example to satan as the dragon or the old serpent is directly from isaiah 27 1 and that day the lord with his hard and great and strong word will punish leviathan the fleeing serpent leviathan leviathan the twisting serpent and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea and in this connection with sea isaiah as well as other books in the hebrew bible parallel sea with the abyss Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the abyss, who made the road in the depths of the sea so that the redeemed might cross over? That's Isaiah 51.10. Sea and abyss, um, Yom and Abu Saz, are common terms in reference to each other. And the abyss in the Old Testament is under the heavens or below. In the cosmic sense, the spirit hovered over the abyss in Genesis 1.2. And the abyss breaks open in Noah's flood. This is not a place of punishment more than it simply is a regional for under the heavens and thus the sea, which is often called the great deep or the abyss, wherein the earth, uh, which is also in the earth or of the earth combined uh, with a region under the heavens. So that's kind of the setting that we've got uh, here. So Isaiah 27, one, for example, notes two things. In that day, I will slay the dragon, not bind the dragon and lock him up for a thousand years uh, so that he stays alive but Isaiah 27 1 is I will slay I will I will terminate I will end the dragon so in that day of 27 1 is directly connected with Isaiah 26 21 which precedes it for behold the Lord will come out of his place to visit the iniquity of the inhabitants of the earth against him and the earth shall disclose her blood and shall cover her slain no more here without question we have reference to resurrection righteous uh, the righteous in isaiah's day as well as ours are invited to go into their chambers and be hidden for a little time until the wrath of god passes by this little time is mirrored in revelation 23 which is also only used in revelation 6 11 where the saints in heaven uh, particularly those who have been slain are uh, are asking for the vengeance of the blood shed upon the earth and we can see that's an allusion to isaiah 26 21 the earth shall disclose its blood They are told to wait for a little time, which is described as when martyrdom is no more. This little time uh, after the thousand years then is when the earth shall disclose her blood and shall cover her slain no more. It's the time that the earth covers the slain in terms of death in the grave. What's also coincident here is that the fleeing serpent and dragon of 27.1 is not barred from heaven wherein uh, wherein he roams the abyss under the heavens within the earth and sea, but is slain 
and we pointed that out. And that's exactly what we find in Revelation 20. And I'm certainly not alone as a biblical scholar in making these uh, kind of connections here with Isaiah. <clears throat> Indeed, Isaiah 26, 19 reads, your dead shall live. My corpse shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for your joy, your dew is the dew of light and the earth will give birth to the dead. This is the most certainly uh, a resurrection passage, explicit bodily resurrection, than it is for the saints, your dead, God's people who have died. They shall live. In connection with this, of course, in the discourse of 20 through 24 through 27, which forms an entire unit, and that's that's very well recognized there. We find, uh, quote, and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering of the cast over all the peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all the faces and the reproach of his people. He will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. That's Isaiah 25, 7 through 8. This verse is directly quoted in Revelation 21, 4. The dragon is slain, death is thrown into the fire, annihilated, and no more. This occurs when the dead are raised. It's very easy then to see that the flying serpent, the dragon, or Leviathan as he is called, um, and in other places, for example, Psalm 74, 13 through 14 refers to the multi-headed multi dragon. Um, the multi-headed dragon of the waters of the sea is linked with Egypt and Pharaoh. The association with the many-headed dragon who Egyptian heads are crushed, nonetheless, is multi-headed. The dragon continues to associate himself uh, with empires that rise up out of the sea. Indeed, praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons and all abysses, in the plural, Psalm 148, 7. God quickly crushes their heads, no doubt, but they continue to rise until finally the dragon will be slain, destroyed once and for all time. It's in this connection of Satan's being hurled out of heaven and sealed from entering heaven again until he appears before the great throne to be judged finally once and for all time that he is imprisoned, Revelation 27. See, uh, he will be set free from his prison implies that he's in a prison. The abusos is a prison. The thousand years is not the reign of the saints more than it is the sentence of time in prison for the devil, confined to the earth and sea, which within the abyss are under the heavens. It's not a it's a not even really a curtailing of his actions. The accuser of the saints and by his accusations, the saints cannot be raised from the dead to receive eternal life and immortality has come to an end. The lamb has ascended in triumph, Revelation five, and death is now given to him as well as the keys to the grave. He has all authority over death, which kills us all, but has not yet vanquished death to the lake of fire. And when he does this, the dead shall be raised, the righteous and the unrighteous. Indeed, quote, by his power, he stilled the sea. By his understanding, he struck down Rahab. By his wind of heavens were made fair. His hand violates the fleeing serpent, Job 26, 13. Not destroys, but violates. The serpent, the dragon, the multi-headed Rahab, Leviathan, lives on. Again, in Isaiah 27, 12, we read, In that day from the river Euphrates, to the brook of Egypt, the Lord will thresh out grain and you will be gathered one by one, O people of Israel. Here, the gathering of the saints occur in that day when the dragon is slain. The next verse, and in that day, a great trumpet will be blown. And those who were lost in the land of Assyria and those who were driven out to the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain at Jerusalem. This is when the dragon is slain. What we find then is a very clear picture in Isaiah. When in that day the dead shall be raised, death shall be no more, the dragon will be destroyed. The Hebrew scriptures then unanimously point to one resurrection at the end of the age, or what Jesus calls the last day, John 6, 40, 44, 54, 11, 24, 12, 48. The last verse is in reference to the unrighteous that will be also judged in the last day. When all, not some, shall be raised. This is the time when all who are in their graves the just and the unjust shall be raised. John 5, 28. Daniel 12, 2 is the same. Not uh, The just and the unjust are raised at the same time together. There is no space of a thousand years between resurrections. None. This brings us to our second consideration, which um, of 
what to do with the language of first resurrection <clears throat> and second death. It's interesting that he says first resurrection. He doesn't say second resurrection, and he doesn't say first death, but second death implies a first death. A first resurrection does not imply a second resurrection. There can be a first and only. With logic, from the second death, we can infer a first death. So there is or can be numerically speaking and logically speaking a first and only, as I've stated here. The fact of the matter is that the dead that are raised all stand before the throne together and are judged together, some to everlasting life and some to the lake of fire. This is the consistent picture we find all throughout the Old Testament and in the New Testament, except for if someone wants to make a specific case here in Revelation 20, one place. John's language is plain enough. Blessed are those having part, that's present active, Blessed are those having part in the first resurrection. What's implied here is that some in John's time of writing now have part in the first resurrection. The word part has in Greek its antonym, which is whole, W-H-O-L-E, part and whole. Whatever the first resurrection is, the saints have a part in it now. Not the whole, but the part. Second, who are those who are designated to have a part in the first resurrection? Well, John denotes them as those slain and those who sit upon thrones in 24. These are, and this can be argued from Greek syntax, two groups of people, those martyred and those who have died and gone on to be with Christ in heaven, which is what Paul says in Philippians and also in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. When you die, you go to be present with the Lord in heaven to await resurrection of the dead. Indeed, we've already seen this. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, the dead which die in the Lord are fully blessed. Even so saith the Spirit, for they shall rest from their labors and their works follow them. This is followed by, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Further, those who have part in the first resurrection are called priests of God and will reign with Christ in heaven who sits on the clouds of heaven, the firstborn of the dead, the first and the last, the one who died and lived, the one who lives forevermore. John saw standing before the throne and in the sight of the lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And these are those who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. This is heaven. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. This is the scene of heaven in the temple of God in heaven. For when the new heavens and the new earth come, there is no more temple, Revelation 21, 22. There is no more day or night either. But here they worship before God, before the throne, in the temple, in heaven, day and night. They have washed their robes while on earth, for the admonition to the saints on earth is to wash our robes. Quote, blessed are the ones washing their robes so that they might have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates, or I'm going to put it in short, die and go to heaven. The washing of our robes from the stains of sin and the blood of the lamb is the duty of the saints on earth. Then upon death, having washed our robes, we enter into the heavenly temple of God as priests, serving him before the throne in heaven until raised from the dead. That is, until the first resurrection saints are raised. All the saints of God are in the first resurrection. They are the first fruits. They are the first to be raised. The dead in Christ shall be raised first. They identify with Jesus, who is the first fruit to be raised. The saints in heaven live with Christ in heaven because they now have a part in what is to come, the first resurrection order. Those in the first resurrection order shall be first because they counted their lives as last. The last shall be first. Paul is loud and clear. The dead in Christ shall be raised first. Well, it can be easy to see here that if we believe in Jesus, the lamb, and receive the blood of his forgiving love, and by this wash away our sins here on earth, enduring it to the end of our lives in death, then we enter into the gates of the heavenly city and reign with him who is on the clouds of heaven before the throne of God and the temple of God day and night, worshiping and serving him as priests. These are the first order saints who shall be raised first from the dead. They are blessed because they die in the Lord. And they are no doubt uh, about, there is no doubt about their participation in the resurrection in the last day. These are the true and blue saints of God. Their salvation is eternally secure. They cannot be ejected from heaven. 
they are once there always there and shall always be with the lord forever and ever they do not have to make their calling and their election sure anymore they have entered into rest and now await resurrection thus we can see here putting this all together that john is not introducing some strange new twist not found anywhere else in the bible rather in concert with the bible the dead are raised at once all at once the just and the unjust at the same time the just and the unjust those found in the book those not found in the book those found in the book are promised resurrection of the first order they shall be raised first they live with christ in heaven and then and in this state have part and the one who has part is guaranteed the whole when it comes indeed the one who has part who is in heaven with christ shall be raised first he need not wash his robes anymore they are washed clean spotless without wrinkle they are in the blessed state in heaven having died with the lord enduring through all tribulations without denying the testimony and witness of jesus christ thus there is only one resurrection of the dead and there are only those who shall be raised first the dead in christ the rest of the dead that's why second resurrection is not mentioned now um that's my first and second uh, major points dealing with isaiah particularly um and what we find here in revelation one minute what we find here in revelation 20 in concert mainly with isaiah 24 through 27 which is alluded to throughout revelation several several times and again i'm uh, severely not alone in making those types of comparisons Thus, in summary, we've seen the fact that Satan is cast out of heaven. Heaven is sealed so that he can no longer stand before the throne with the sons of God as he had done before. Uh, for example, Zechariah 4 or Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. The lamb has ascended and there is no room nor place uh, for the lamb and the accuser before the throne. One of them has to go. And so he's hurled to the land and to the sea, the below, the depth, the abyss under the heavens wherein he roams seeking whom he may devour it and it's sealed over him he cannot get back up into heaven not not until the great white throne judgment when as accuser of the brethren he again is once again needed as the prosecutorial role that he certainly plays that's why it's interesting god keeps him around while greatly hindered with chains nonetheless he is still able to authorize power to beasts kings horns rulers princes breathes out rivers of flood in order to drown, kill, destroy, persecute the saints who are also under the heavens. Like a crime boss operating his syndicate while doing time, Satan, who is designated ruler of the world that follows him, commands his human rulers to do his bidding. We can see then that while Satan has bound the nations under his sway and power cannot, will not, extinguish the saints or the gospel that is operating as a testimony and witness in the nations until the end comes. And I will stop there. Dr. Sam Frost, thank you very much for that first opening statement. Feeling, we're going to hand it over to you. And you have between 16 and 17 minutes to make your case. The floor is yours, Feeling. Go ahead. And then just make sure to unmute. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Donnie. I appreciate this. Um, in, in defending the truths of the premillennial advent, um, I usually use a threefold chord of scripture, reason, and church tradition. Of course, in this uh, presentation, it's going to be a real quick presentation. I'm going to try to go through as much uh, material as I can uh, in a very brief compass of time. So I'm going to stick strictly to the scriptures for this presentation. And I think it's going to be very interesting because while I may get into some of the historic connotations of premillennialism, I think it's important to show that amillennialism is not based on a biblical understanding of Revelation 20. Now, my purpose in this very quick presentation will be to show, firstly, that premillennialism does represent the biblical understanding of uh, John's apocalypse. Also, to prove that regardless of when you believe the millennium began, or whether or not you think it's happening now, it definitely was not happening during the Pentecostal period. So my, my this is going to be the centerpiece of my exhibit, uh, that the millennium was not happening during the Pentecostal period. And so therefore, we have to look for it in a future context, at least within the framework of the apostolic writings. So from, I guess, AD 30, or, or you could say AD 33, to AD 70, at least until the end of the book of Acts, 
there was no millennium. There was no reigning with Christ. So I asked myself and I went through, you know, several texts and I, you know, looked through the scriptures and I did my best to try to find if there are any parallel texts which stand parallel to Revelation 20. And I found two texts which perhaps may be parallel. And the first one is Matthew chapter 19, verse uh, 28. And then the second one is going to be Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. So let's uh, go uh, discuss these in order. First, uh, Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. And I'm going to be quoting from memory here. So if I mess up, don't, uh, you know, don't knock me on the head. But uh, Christ told his disciples, ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So now I've read some amillennial literature, which does use this uh, to describe what that, you know, to is parallel to the millennium. But of course, a lot of amillennialists, they don't like that passage because now, you know, it's talking about the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, you know, whether 12 tribes of Israel are going to be restored or not, that's something out of the Old Testament. We've moved beyond that now. And so uh, they try to de-emphasize uh, the significance of that verse. But I have to say that in other uh, commentaries I've read that they, they really, they hop all over and they say, well, this is a spiritual, these are spiritual thrones, these are spiritual authorities, uh, you know, binding and loosing, you know, uh, canceling elements of the mosaic economy and all that. Uh, you know, Peter, uh, you know, struck Ananias dead, that kind of authority was the reigning with Christ. The problem with that, of course, is that you have, uh, if this is your point of departure, for understanding the millennium, you have to ask, well, we which have followed me, well, followed me till when? Followed me till the crucifixion? Followed me till the ascension? Uh, if you look at the, the entire body of Christ's teaching, uh, he did suggest that uh, he expected his disciples to follow him until death. And uh, of course, you know, uh, Matthew chapter 10, he, he predicted that there would be uh, persecutions, that they would brought be, be brought before kings, magistrates, and that they had to follow him unto the end, unto death, unto the telos, which I believe is a midpoint of Daniel's 70th week. I can't really discuss that right now. But, of course, uh, if this was happening during the Pentecostal period, then you have really you have 12 Jewish apostles reigning over, 12, reigning over ethnic Israel. And it's basically it's an Israel-only style millennium. Uh, the, the point that I, I really think is important here is to, to understand that Pente Pentecost was an exclusively Jewish fulfillment of prophecy. Um, the Gentiles were not called until, uh, until Peter, Peter was sent to the house of Cornelius. In fact, Peter needed a special revelation to, uh, to tell him to go to the Gentiles, that yes, the Gentiles are clean, and that you can consort with the Gentiles, that you can preach the gospel, that they can enter the fold. So, you know, the, uh, the prophecy of Joel, uh, of the of the Holy Spirit, that was a prophecy. That was a promise made to the Jewish nation. It was being fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. There were no Gentiles present. Uh, there were no Gentile. There was no Gentile calling until uh, until the house of until Peter was sent to the house of Cornelius in Acts ten. The the Gentiles are made co partakers of Israel's covenantal and national privileges. But this is the point that I really want to bring out because. The point, the very fact that salvation was still Jewish for the first 12 years after the ascension proves that the church's standing in Christ was transitional throughout the Pentecostal period. Now, if the church's standing was transitional throughout the Pentecostal period, at least in terms of ethnicity, right, then we can expect that it was also transitional in other things. Now, hold that thought because this is exactly confirmed by Ephesians uh chapter 2, verse 6, where Paul says, and hath raised us up and made us to, uh, to sit in heavenly places in Christ. Now, this was written after the Acts 28 council. So Acts 28, I consider that a very important, uh, very important chapter. Uh, it's, really, it's really a turning point in, in, the, in the divine narrative, where you have salvation uh, being given, being offered to the Jew first until Acts 28, and then you see the middle walls of partition start to come down. So I really want you to keep this in mind because in Romans, Paul talks about uh, being crucified, dead, and risen with Christ, but he doesn't use a co-ascension motif until, until Ephesians, until after the Acts 28 council. So Ephesians 2.6 is the first time a co-ascension 
motif is used in Paul's writings. So this is on, obviously we're talking about progressive revelation. We're not just talking about progressive revelation, though. We're talking about a transitional economy where things where 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 um, the church is being taken away from, say, the the, the kingdom hope of Israel, and now is being en entering into a transitional economy where instead of the kingdom coming at any moment as it was during this 40 year period, now it's starting to be revealed that the kingdom program is ramping down. And of course, uh, instead of the kingdom coming to us, we're being translated into the kingdom. So in addition to being crucified with Christ, uh, risen with Christ, uh, we're now co-ascended with Christ, but this was not revealed before Acts 28. So Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 itself cannot be applied to any time during the Acts period. In fact, uh, which talks about they who, uh, who did not take the mark of the beast and who were beheaded, etc., etc. It doesn't apply to any time during the Pentecostal period. There was nobody, the beast was never was never a prominent fact during this time. Now, it was, it was, um, he was at hand. I, I would imagine the mystery of iniquity was ripening during the time when Paul wrote, but John was still looking for the beast to ascend out of the bottomless pit. So that's something to really think about. Those saints who had faithfully uh, passed through this period would be raised to reign with Christ. And that was John's hope, wasn't it? John's hope was that the, uh, was that the well? I think I believe that he that Revelation was written shortly after Nero's death, and the the recent uh, persecution was still fresh in their minds, right? And not only was it fresh in their minds, but John felt that, that Nero would return. There was a Nero redivivus view that was common within the Roman Empire during that time. So I think that's really important to keep in mind. The earliest uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 can be applied to is, is after the persecution under Nero. And of course, we have partial preterist scholars, you know, Gentry, Damar, those guys, which say, well, this is Nero. This is the Great Tribulation. This is the 42 months. And the, the saints who had passed successfully through this period and had withstood these corruptions of the Roman Empire, the Mark of the Beast, whatever they think that is, and all these other things, those are the ones being being described as being raised in the first resurrection. So the text is very specific that it includes these people who had passed through this 40 month, 42 month period. Of course, this was not happening during the Pentecostal period at all. There was no beast persecuting the saints. The beast only reigns, he's only given power for 42 months, and then he's taken alive at the parousia. So the 42 months, you've got to count back from the parousia, okay? So if the parousia happened in AD 70, count back to AD 67, obviously. Doesn't work. Nero died in AD 68, but I've got to move on. Uh, so the scriptures written during the Pentecostal period teach two things, which I think effectively debunk uh, millennialism. First, they teach the saints... We're not reigning with Christ. Second, he teaches that Satan was still very much active. He certainly wasn't bound in the sense that John describes it in the apocalypse. And I do think the bottomless pit is a location. I don't think it's an abstract concept. And if you look at, uh, if we go back to Daniel chapter seven, we see that there are thrones set in association with a judgment that takes place on the little horn and identical language, of course, is used in the book of Revelation Revelation 4, we see 24 elders seated on thrones. We see a book being opened. We then read about a series of judgments, which culminates with a, a period of 42 months in which the beast is given power. The beast is finally cast into the fire. And then, of course, uh, we have the kingdom being established. So I think that everything in the book of Revelation, I agree with Sam 100%, everything in the book of Revelation goes back to the Old Testament. And it does say that, of course, I believe it says in Daniel that there, once the beast is disgraced, that the other kingdoms have their lives prolonged or something to that effect. So there will not be, it's not the end of history. What it is, it's the end of a dispensation. And that's what eschatology is primarily about. It's not the end of human history. It's the end of the present dispensation. So moving from John to Paul, we find that he expressly, Paul that is, expressly states in at least two texts that they were not reigning, that the saints were not reigning during his ministry. In 1 Corinthians 4, 8, he says, uh, now ye are full, now ye are rich, ye have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God ye did reign that we almost might, that we might, might reign with you. 
And then, of course, he says, but we, of course, are made the last of all. We're persecuted and tortured and we go hungry. And he says all of these things, basically, which we're enduring right now, prove that we're not reigning with Jesus Christ. So I think that's important. And that verb, uh, I believe it's sum basaluo, is used one more time in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 12, where Paul said, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. He, he saw clearly that they were not reigning with Christ. They had to endure unto the end. They had to endure persecutions. They were not just given the crown right away. Of course, if this is happening in the spiritual realm that we don't know anything about it, that's something that we really can't prove. Of course, I would certainly say that that's probably a step, a major step toward Gnosticism, or at least Neo-Gnosticism, but we can get into that, I guess, during the rebuttal. Revelation uh, chapter 12, verse 9, uh, does say that Satan's cast out of heaven. He says, he which is deceiving the whole world. I, I looked at numerous translations, every single one, except there's a few that say the deceiver of the whole world, but every single one, every single one of the literal translations I looked at, said, which deceiveth, as the King James Version aptly translates, which deceiveth the whole world. And he was still deceiving the world when John wrote the apocalypse. So he was definitely not cast out of, uh, he was certainly not uh, locked in the bottomless pit when John wrote the apocalypse. Peter had written saying, you know, he walked about as a lion seeking whom he may devour. So if the language means anything, and this is where we have to go to perspicuity of language, and we have to understand that, you know, revelatory language is meant to be understood. It's also meant to be harmonized and calibrated against other statements. And so all these, um, these indicators that show, well, he's prince of the power of the air. He's the god of this age. Uh, he walked about as a lion seeking whom he may devour. Possibly the nations were still under the power of Satan, Acts chapter 26, verse 18. And many more texts can be adduced. But I need to move on to my next and probably my last exhibit, which is the phrase Anastasis Ectonecron. And as a preface, I might say that Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, which are often uh, taken uh, by classic Al Mills as text descriptive of the general resurrection, only teach that, uh, that many, not all, will be, will be uh, raised in connection with the Great Tribulation. So to be sure, the phrase Anastasis tone necron is used when referring to the resurrection. But when the preposition ek is used, it means that some dead bodies are to be left behind. Christ's resurrection was out of the dead. It was an Anastasis ek tone necron. It was out from among the dead. And the strongest example of this usage can be seen in Philippians chapter 3, verse 11, where Paul says, if by any means I might attain unto the out-resurrection from among the dead, it's Anastasis tone necron. Uh, Paul was sure that one day he would be raised. He had no doubt of attaining to the resurrection, to the resurrection of the dead. He was wishing to attain to the uh, to the ex anastasis, to the out resurrection from among the dead, uh, the better resurrection or the resurrection of the just. I think Christ even said, they who attain unto that age and the resurrection from among the dead. So there is a certain goal in mind. And Paul said he was reaching towards that goal. So that's very, very important. And he was not sure of attaining yet to the first resurrection. Of course, toward the end of his life, he said, yes, I finished the course. But he was still he was still running a race. And this brings us to the phrase rest of the dead in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. First resurrection, resurrection of unjust have to be of the same nature. Whether you think it's a second resurrection, it was not mentioned in the text. Well, the rest of the dead have to be raised. So if I say, well, I'm going to give you $5 of the money that I owe you now. I'm going to give you the rest of the money tomorrow. Well, it's, you know, you're going to assume there's the same currency, you know, that it's the same. I'm not going to give you, you know, uh, you know, spiritual money now and the physical money later. So it's the same thing. This has been brought out by, okay, thank you. This has been brought out by, uh, by various expositors, including John Gill, some of the best expositors, as a matter of fact. But all that aside, I think the biggest reason why our millennialism can't be true is because Jesus Christ instructed his disciples to look for his return. In the Olivet Discourse, he told his disciples, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Also keep in mind that the Great Commission doesn't allow us to be picky and choosy about which elements of Christ's teaching where to follow. Of course, if there was at least a thousand years before uh, between his return and the time when he uh, issued those passages, then... Uh, everything Christ said falls to the ground and validates his own teachings. And so we have to keep in mind that uh, uh, if, the, if the millennium happens first, then 
how do we deal with Christ's teachings? How do we clear him from the charges of confusion, contradiction, or outright falsehood? We're not waiting for him to return. We're waiting for the millennium to end. And that I think is the most potent uh, piece of, uh, most potent uh, article that I can probably uh, present in this presentation. Thank you, Donnie. Thank you, Phelan. Gentlemen, I appreciate your opening statements. Lots of excellent points for us to engage in rebuttals and cross-exam. So we're now moving into our eight-minute rebuttal. Uh, we're going to hand it back to you, Sam. Whenever you're ready, just let me know, and I'll start your timer. The floor is yours. Go ahead. Yep. Um, <clears throat> well, there are several things just taking notes here about the clear use of Scripture. I don't know how clear you can get when in John 5, 28, he says, all who are in their tombs, the just and the unjust. He, there's no space of time there in John 5, 28. And then, and then just a few verses, a, a little bit more. So you ask when uh, all the dead, do not marvel at this, that all the dead shall come out of their tombs, the just and the unjust. When? Well, the next chapter, John 6 answers that five times in the last day with the article in the last day and if that's not clear enough then john uh 12 states that the condemnation of the unjust will be in the last day I, um that that to me and john is the one who received the revelation of revelation 20. great place to put a thousand years there but he it's 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 it isn't there and it's nowhere in the presentation of the material uh that most of the top tier commentaries today understand that Revelation 20 is largely in reference to Isaiah 24 through 27, which is a which is a, a block in Isaiah that's recognized and called even by Frank Gabling in his commentary series is called the Little Apocalypse. It's been known as the Little Apocalypse because all of the constituent elements are right there in 24 through 27 quoted and alluded to in revelation several times um the swallowing up of death for example 25 is quoted in revelation 21 that's clearly the end well when does that happen when the dragon is slain when he is slain the earth shall conceal the earth will disclose the blood of the slain upon the earth that's isaiah 26 which is which quotes Thy dead shall live. My corpse, my body shall live. That's resurrection. When? When when the dragon is slain. So when is when is the resurrection of the dead in Isaiah? Now you can argue for progressive revelation, uh, but if progress if your view of progressive revelation is uh, a, a a point that you need to make because your view of Revelation 20 is simply not found in the Old Testament. It's just not there. And then he said, well, progressively, it didn't, uh, nobody knew about this. In Acts, they didn't know about the thousand years. And, and uh, up until the dispensational, you know, up until 5.30 p.m. on 40, uh, 52 A.D., 5.40, somewhere God switched. And then all of a sudden he, hey, hey oh, there's a thousand years that's coming up here. Uh, uh Talk about, I mean, the perspicuity of scripture it, all along is, is noting that there's one great event that is the hope, and that is the resurrection of the dead, which is includes all of those faithful of Israel from the founding of Israel until the last day, as well as the nations that have joined to Israel's covenants and Israel's promises. But I find that another thing that um, that was mentioned that just peaks and I can't, we can't, obviously, we don't have the time, but um, he said that there weren't any Jews whatsoever at the Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And that directly contradicts uh, verse 11 of chapter 2 of Acts, which says both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring wonders of God with our own tongues. Uh, Cretans and Arabs are not Jews. They may, they're convert, co converting to Jews. And we know that there's a long uh, far before Jesus got on the scene, that, that Jews were proselytizing and converting uh, Gentiles that were interested in that Gentile conversion goes back to Naaman, it goes back to Jonah, who goes to Assyria. Uh, the Jews were always called, Israel was always called to be a light to the nations. Deuteronomy 4, the whole point 
of setting up Israel is so that they would be practicing their faith and their religion and God would be dwelling among them and the nations would see the light among them and say, what so nation is so great as Israel that has so their God so close to them and they would be drawn to it. This was Israel's entire mission. This is, this is, and Jesus told his disciples when he, uh, when he was ascending, he told his disciples, go ye into the Gentile, go ye into the nations. It, it doesn't start in Acts 13 or something like that. Uh, Philip uh, Philip is talking to an Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. They're already talking to Gentiles. But God pushes them and says this light, this this idea of this, this, this expansive, this enlarging of the nation. That's Isaiah again. The nation is enlarged. And it's interesting. Uh, that in Isaiah, the passage that is alluded to for Gentile expansion is in Isaiah's little apocalypse. It, the very passage is in the little apocalypse of Isaiah. <clears throat> we find it in Isaiah in chapter 26. Um, in chapter 26, where it says in, uh, here we go, chapter 26. It says that you have, in verse 15, you have enlarged the nation, O Lord. You have enlarged the nation. You have gained glory for yourself. You have extended all the borders of the land. This idea is picked up in Isaiah 60 when the calling and the light to the nations have come, the enlargement, which is a promise that goes back to Japheth in Genesis chapter 9, by the way. Um, but listen to Isaiah 26. We... We're with child and writhed in pain, but we gave birth to win. We have not brought salvation to the earth. We've given birth to the people of the world or given birth to the people of the world. Your dead will live. My corpse will live. The dead will live. When? The Lord will punish with his sword, the fierce, great, powerful sword, the Leviathan, gliding serpent. Levi this is uh, the old serpent, the ancient serpent, the dragon. That, that's the language of Isaiah here. The serpent, and he will slay the monster of the sea or in, in other places i demonstrated in parallelisms in hebrew abu um, uh, techom uh, which is translated in the septuagint with abusas so techom is the hebrew word and you'll find that very often translated with the word uh yom which is sea it's parallel with it uh the deep which is the sea the deep and so this is where satan is thrown woe to the earth and to the sea because his anger and his wrath has come upon you. So I don't see this binding of Satan, and neither did Irenaeus, interestingly enough, in, in book three, uh, chapter 18, section six, he talks about how Jesus has bound the strong man and now uh, 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 spoils his goods by bringing in. That's the language of Revelation 20, and Irenaeus is using that, and there are several others that do that as well, that, that we would consider Kilius, but they nonetheless use the language of Jesus ruling now and uh, storming the castles now and taking the bounty of Satan now. There, this doesn't mean that Satan no longer uh, hates us and seeks to destroy us and everything else. He's still alive. He, he's he's bound, but he's still alive. His activity has been curtailed, but he still does what he does. It's still, it is what it is that he does. But with Jesus now ascended to the throne to the right hand of the Father in heaven and all power and authority given to him, there's only room for uh, for one. And so the accuser goes and the lamb ascends. And so the accuser is thrown out of heaven uh, for a thousand years and woe to the earth and sea, meaning this calls for patient endurance on our part because he's really, he's really going to, he thought you saw wars and great tribulation before such great tri tri uh, tribulation shall be, Jesus says, such great tribulation shall be until no more, until there's no more tribulation. So I'm not a dispensationalist. I used to be a full preterist. I don't operate within preterism circles. I don't operate within dispensational circles. And my brand of amillennialism is not your typical amillennial uh, view. I'm more focusing on the drift of, of what a few current biblical scholars are doing. Um, but, you know, I call it amillennialism because that's what it's called. But I, I don't, I, I just don't see any room for uh, going through everything that we're going through now and then Jesus comes back and then for a thousand years he does what it is that he does and then Satan comes back out and then there's another great war at the end of that. Uh, there's nothing in scripture that gives any precedent for that and rather Revelation 20 should be interpreted in the light of the wealth of scriptures that come before it. Dr. Sam Frost, thank you very much for 
that first rebuttal. Feeling we're going to hand it back to you. You have about nine minutes for a rebuttal. And so whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Okay, thanks, Tiny. Well, Sam brought out a lot of good stuff. And as a matter of fact, I hope I can I hope I can get through all this stuff because there's a lot of meat and there's a lot of a lot of material that he gave that's that's really good food for thought. I respect Sam. I think he's a good scholar and I think he's got he makes a lot of good points and I always learn from him when I listen to him. Um, but I'm gonna be just tackling some of his statements that he made during his initial presentation. Um, I'm not so sure. Okay, so his um, his interpretation of the abyss as the sea, I'm not so sure about that. I think that more texts would have to be looked at. Uh, the commentaries that I've read, which are standard commentaries, uh, you know, written by, um, you know, unquestioned masters in their chosen craft, uh, and of course, uh, very knowledgeable in the Greek and Hebrew tongue, uh, would also probably lean against that. Now, the bottomless pit, I believe it's a location but I don't believe it's necessarily synonymous with the sea. We do see the bottomless pit being opened in Revelation chapter 9, uh, verse 2, and we see smoke arising out of, the, out of the bottomless pit. We see that John was expecting uh, the beast to arise out of the bottomless pit when he spoke. So I'm not so sure now. It might be because the beast, we see the beast coming from the sea in Revelation chapter 13, but I wouldn't Certainly don't want to be dogmatic about that, and I'm not so sure I think Sam wants to be uh, either. Now, as far as slaying the dragon that is in the sea, I believe personally uh, that this dragon that he's talking about is the beast, only because the beast is, Satanism is slain through his tool. Uh, Satan is embodied in the beast. <clears throat> in fact, Revelation does sometimes use such terminology is that it talks about a person or a political ruler as a dragon. In uh, Ezekiel chapter 29, verse 3, it says, Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers, which hath said, My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. So I think that, again, I think that the Satan is embodied in the beast. The beast is seen rising out of the sea. And then it's this beast that is being slain in Isaiah's little apocalypse. The important thing to keep in mind is in the little apocalypse, it says the great trumpet will be blown. And then, of course, uh, they who are ready to perish in the lands of Assyria and all these other lands will come and worship the Lord in, the whole, in, in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is, of course, this is the camp of the saints. Where, of course, in the, we read in uh, Revelation 20, when Satan is unloosed, he comes against the camp of the saints. Well, the beloved city, beloved city is on earth. It's not in heaven. So when this period ends, they'll come against the camp of the saints. Now, I can't really get into all of the text, but of course, we remember Zechariah chapter 14. You know, all nations will keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, you know, when Jesus Christ touches down at the Mount of Olives, there's going to be some seismic disturbances. The mountain's going to split in two. And then, of course, living waters will, will run forth from Jerusalem. All those texts are all that can all be harmonized with Isaiah's little apocalypse to show that it's an earthly hope that we're looking for. So it's not the end. It's not that everybody, everything's going to be, you know, raptured into heaven. Um, it's going to be definitely there's going to be a continuation of earthly existence except that it's going to be under the personal reign and administration of Jesus Christ, which is going to change the game quite a bit, both politically and religiously. Now, as far as Satan, how he is described in the New Testament, he's described as connected with the air. So the prince of the power of the air, I believe he was thrown out of the third heaven at Jesus Christ's ascension. So he became the prince of the power of the air. And then of course, when Jesus Christ um, comes from the third heaven. He's going to set up his tribunal in the first heaven. That's seen, uh, that is seen in uh, Revelation chapter 12, I believe. And this is where there's that great war with Michael, the archangel. Michael stands up for the children of Israel. Satan is cast to earth. And then there's, of course, there's a great tribulation. Um, I think, again, text harmonize scripture, interpreting scripture is the best way to go on that. But he's called the prince of the power of the air, the spirit which now worketh in the children of disobedience. So already working in the children of disobedience. He was seen walking about as a lion, or at least Peter described him as walking about as a lion who's transforming himself into an angel of light, certainly deceiving the nations. He's been deceiving the nations for the past 2000 years. You have to ask yourself, uh, is Islam a deception? 
is uh, were the pagan Roman emperors. Uh, their, their pag was the paganism of the pre-Constantinian period. Was that a deception? Are the people in the... Uh, you know, in third world countries that don't haven't heard the gospel that are worshiping perhaps idols or engaging in occult and fetishistic practices. Is that a deception? I think we need to rid ourselves somewhat of the uh, of the white Eurocentric uh, sort of mindset that, you know, well, you know, the Roman Empire accepted uh, Christianity. So that means the nations are, you know, he's not deceiving the nations. Well, what about China? What about the islands of the sea? What about uh, what about uh Native America. Um, you know, the gospel didn't go out to them until centuries and centuries afterwards. Africa wasn't fully evangelized until the, probably the close of the, uh, of the 19th century, even as early as the beginnings a few decades of the 20th century. So to say simply that, well, it's because Constantine accepted Christianity and because Rome eventually accepted Christianity is proof that Satan was bound is just a foolish statement. And it's, it's, it, it makes us guilty, uh, or it makes those who hold that view, I think, guilty of white European uh, ethnocentrism. I think it's really just a, an ignorant position. Now, as far as having only a part in the first resurrection, I think that's a bit of hair splitting on Sam's part. I think you know having part in anything simply means participating in it. If I have part in a sweepstake or a you know, uh, um, uh, somebody sends me a, you know, a uh, an invitation saying you have part in this ceremony. It doesn't mean necessarily that I'm only going to, you know, it, it doesn't have the exclusivity that Sam thinks it does. So having part in something, I think that's a bit of hair splitting. Yes, they partake and participate in the first resurrection. Of course, if the first resurrection started uh, on the day of Pentecost, then, well, yeah, there's some people that are having part in it. They're not even reigning the full thousand years. The people who are uh, you know, who died early on in the Christian, uh, you know, church age, they're going to reign the full thousand years. But people who are saved maybe tomorrow or, you know, a few years from now, there might only reign a few years. So yeah, they're having part in it. But I don't think that was the intent of the author when he said they will have part in the first resurrection. I think he simply meant that they will be participating in the first resurrection. Of course, participation means, in my understanding, participating in the reign of Christ for, for the full thousand years. Uh, no mention of the second resurrection. I don't conceive that to be relevant only because, um, you know, we're dealing now with the missing word, you know, argument. Well, yeah, there might not be, you know, specifically mentioned, but the rest of the dead are mentioned. So like I said before, if I give you a slice of pecan pie now and I say, I'm going to give you the rest of the pie to take home, it's the same pie. I'm giving you the same pie. I'm not giving you a spiritual piece and a physical piece. I'm not giving you a piece of lemon pie and a piece of the rest of the pecan pie. It's the same exact pie. So the rest of the dead are the rest of the dead. If the first resurrection is is a spiritual uh, then I think it's safe to say that the second resurrection uh, is also spiritual. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot that Sam brought out that's, you know, I, I think it's valid, but it's valid from the standpoint of, you know, I think, you know, trying to crowd everything together and, you know, take place at once. And that doesn't see that the, the day of the Lord, I think the day of the Lord is that thousand year period. It's the seventh day. And so we have the redemptive week being revealed, um, I think, early on in the Christian economy. And uh, when Paul said quite clearly, he said there remaineth a Sabbathism, a Sabbath keeping for the people of God. He said if Mo, if uh, they uh, if uh, they if they if uh, David had given them rest or Joshua had given them rest, he would not therefore have spoken of another day. So there is a day, there is a Sabbathism to the people of God. Um, and of course, um, I think that's going to wrap it up for now. There's probably some other stuff that I missed, but I think I'll, I'll catch it. I'll catch it on the next go. Thanks, Donnie. Thank you, Phelan. Gentlemen, that concludes our opening statements and our rebuttals. Fantastic debate so far as we move into our cross-examination. So the first round of cross will be 25 minutes. Phelan just ended with his rebuttal. And so, Dr. Frost, we're going to hand it back to you. You get to lead the way for the first 25 minutes. Go ahead, gentlemen. Um, well, I don't know. I, taking notes, not knowing to begin. Um, 
Makarios kai hagios ekon meras. So uh, twenty Revelation twenty six. Uh, um, meras does not participate. That's not the word. It's a different Greek word for that. Uh, meras, the intent, the antonym of meras is halos, which is whole. Where actually where we get the transliteration of the word whole from. So meras is part. Um, you don't have the whole. You have part. It's not participating in. It's you. You. If I gave you, uh, if I owed you twenty dollars and I only gave you ten, I gave you part. You're not participating in the twenty dollars. I, I just gave you part. You don't have the whole twenty dollars. So that that's uh, I'll take that up with any Greek professor on Earth because that's where I I got the information from is Little and Scott and Thayer's and uh, Bauer, Art Gingrich, and all the rest of it. So anyway, that's 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 what the phrasing. Uh, means and there's uh, again many um sam i just want to make sure there's a question in there so, for feeling so my question is, is, a, a, is um that's not that's not participating and then yeah. so but then you turned around and said well yeah they participate they have a part well which is it yeah well i believe that they are participating they are right. taking part in christ's reign they're not reigning the whole world themselves they're Reigning Christ has the authority, and then they're given delegated authority. So that so if he says, have thou authority over 10 cities, well, yes, 10 cities is a part of his worldwide rule. So you could look at it in that sense. I don't have a problem with that. Okay. Um, well, good. Neither do but I. It's still, it, it's still participation. Okay. So yeah, it's it's some 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 work from the Greek to to, to flesh it out. But yeah, I agree. It's they're having part. But I don't think that limits necessarily limits the, uh, you know, the the reign to heaven, as you suggested in your opening. I don't think it's a heavenly reign because it says they have part as if only part of their uh, the total man can reign. Okay, well your spirit's going to reign, but your body's not going to reign. I don't think it's a part in that sense. I think it's a part in the sense that Jesus Christ is going to have worldwide authority, and they're going to be partaking of some of that some of that root some of those rulership responsibilities and i think that's just the safest thing we can say i i think the other thing is I, you you seem to place me with some post-millennial thinking about constantine and all that stuff and i don't really i don't really give a big giant hoot about constantine and what he oh, did okay um i don't i don't see that as any uh, Jesus Christ ascended to the right hand of the Father in all power, glory, and authority and the keys of heaven, the keys of life, death, hell, all of it was given to him. He owns it right now as we speak. Uh, he's not waiting for some extra tidbit to get that he doesn't yet have. Uh, would you agree with that? Well, I think that he's got his, his kingly authority is certainly, uh, I, I mean, the way I explain it to people, Sam, is that, you know, David was anointed as king, right? He was anointed by Samuel, but he wasn't, he didn't sit on the throne right away. He still had there had enemies to subdue. And when, of course, Absalom uh, came into Jerusalem and David said, hey, look, we need to leave. Absalom's here. He crossed over by the way of the Mount of Olives. He went over Jordan, went over to Maenaim, I believe. And he was still king. He was still king. It had nothing to do with his royal ju judicial prerogative, except he wasn't exercising his judicial authority. During that time that Absalom reigned, it was a kingdom. It was in. It was a, a default. It was a. Um, it was a revolted um, province. Judea was a revolted province at the time because Ab Absalom had taken over, and so there's no question that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But is he exercising his full judicial prerogatives? And I would have to say, no, he is not. Not until all nations become subject to him. And that's not going to happen in any accommodated sense. That's got to happen in a real sense because David subdued all of his enemies. And Christ is certainly not going to do less than David. He's going to do more than David. He's really going to subdue his enemies. So I don't think, I, I think splitting hairs on that issue, I, I really believe Jesus Christ on his father's throne right now. Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And I think at that point, that's when he's going to come into Jerusalem. He's going to return by, you know, his, he's going to touch down at the Mount of Olives, literally. And he's going to reign over the saints for a thousand years from the city of Jerusalem. I think that's very clear in the Old Testament scriptures. Um, do you believe in a third temple being built? Well, I'll tell you what, I believe in there's going to be a temple. Yes, I believe there's a, there's going to be a temple. Yeah. 
So if that's the case, and Paul knew that the temple would be destroyed in 70 AD, then there's then there's clearly no way that he had any idea of any sort of eminence whatsoever. Because because basically it sets up Paul saying, well, I know this temple is going to be destroyed, but for the prophecies to be fulfilled, there's got to be a third one. So they're going to rebuild another one after. I mean, is that how Paul was operating? I don't. I don't believe that. I mean, I'm I'm not a dispensationalist. I'm actually a historic premillennial, so I don't believe that a temple has to be built before he 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 can return. Now that may be the case. There may be a temple built, and I believe I was reading Hippolytus the other night his treatise on Christ versus anti or Christ and Antichrist, and he said that Antichrist is going to rebuild the temple for the Jews. And I don't think there's anything that specifically requires a temple to be built. I, I've gone on record before stating that I believe that Jesus Christ, the parousia could, could happen within, you know, within any lifetime. It could happen within, you know, as soon as the Jews, as soon as uh, the 144,000 first fruits offering is sealed and, you know, revivals can take place quick. Um, a revival can take place in a day or a couple of days. So I think we could see it. It's going to happen very quick, very, very, very quickly. So, when in Revelation 14, it says, I looked and there before me standing on Mount Zion with the lamb was the 144,000 written with their father. Uh, and I heard a voice from the sound of heaven. The, the view there is clearly heaven. They're in, they're in the heavenly temple around the heavenly sea. And yeah. they're on Mount Zion, which is in heaven. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, what because... we, what, when did they get there? Well, that's what happens. I believe that that's when they're raptured up. There's going to be a rapture, and they're going to be summoned. They're going to be called to the to the they're convened to the temple. There was a I think it's in Numbers ten. It's about the trumpets. When the trumpets, when you blow an alarm with the trumpets, that they, they, it gathers the assembly, and so all of the assembly, the the saints are going to be raptured up at a point um, anterior to Christ's actual pouring out those vials of wrath. Now. There's debate among us, among us premillennialists, as to when this exactly occurs. I believe it's going to occur before the vials of wrath, but where exactly in the timeline, we don't always see eye to eye on that. But when they're seen in Revelation 14, that's after they've been caught up. And then, of course, this is when the harvest comes. There's a harvest in a vintage. The harvest, of course, you know, the harvest and vintage are a little bit different. But anyways, go ahead, Sam. I'm sorry I... No, that's fine. I just I'm getting confused because now you've got something completely in the future, but then you believe Revelation was written somewhere around sixty-seven or wherever, yeah. and the uh, with the revived Nero myth, which actually wasn't until second century that idea kind of came around. But um, but nonetheless, why would John be concerned about Nero when clearly the rapture of these hundred and forty-four thousands is way way out of his his uh, contemporary time? Why would Nero? No, I think they were. I think they were working on getting, trying to get Israel saved. That was the whole function of the apostolic ministry. And if they had had that one hundred and forty-four thousand, that was the first fruits offering needed to trigger the eschaton. So what? So so when when Paul visited Jerusalem for the last time, James said, "Hey man, you know all these thousands of Jews believe, but they're, they're you. They see you in town, and you're going to try to tell them not to keep the law of Moses. Come on, man, we got to play this right." To he didn't want them to fall away because he was still working for. They were still. You know, the hope of Israel was still in the forefront and they were still trying to make trying to get that to happen. And so the 144,000 had that happen. It would have triggered the eschaton. He sees that in reference to the um, to Daniel's 70th week. But also he sees that that Nero is going to be resurrected. They had a few years, a very, very couple of years left until that 40 year of probation was over. And so the sign of the prophet Jonas was only good for 40 years. So it's right at the 11th hour. He sees about everything's about to happen. I'm coming quickly. I'm coming quickly. And of course, the 144,000 wasn't sealed up. And so that's why that's why nothing happens, because after that, the intermediate economy starts. And Paul had already expressed, you know, the truths concerning this economy in his prison epistles. He says, no, he says, we're being translated into the kingdom. Um you know, it's it's a it's a little. You know, I wrote a book called The King and the Kingdom. It goes into this this whole issue of postponement, and uh, it's really it's is apotelismatic, as Randall Price put it, um, understanding of the parousia. Apotelismatic being meaning you know prophetic postponement. 
Um, again, I'm, I'm going on and on. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm hearing, you, you say you're not dispensationalist and I'm hearing a lot of dispensationalists and then you're not preterist, but I'm hearing, I'm hearing 40 year transition period. That's, which as you know, is the core staple of, of, of our, uh, my full preterism when mm -hmm. I was a full preterist leader and, and teacher, Don Preston and I, uh, we hammered the 40 year transition period. Uh, nobody else really does other than dispensationalists and, and full preterists. So that's that's what I find. That's why I'm glad I'm an amillennialist today, because I don't have to be locked into these kind of things. Amillennialism gives me this kind of a bit of, of freedom. But but for you, you're talking about postponement. Um, you're talking about 40 year transition, end of covenant. So are you are you still wrapped into this 70 AD kind of fulfillment thing? No, I don't see 70. I don't see any eschatology taking place in 70 AD. I would call 70 AD more uh, of an eschatological breakwater than any fulfillment of eschatology. And I don't think the 40 years is simply was simply the time period dur during which there was a transition from, say, the old covenant dispensation of bondage to the new covenant dispensation of liberty. So it was Moses's authority uh, to um, uh, to prescribe, as it were. OK, the spiritual uh, needs and necessities of that dispensation. Well, this all ended. Of course, it, it, it ended at the cross, but it also went, went on until AD 70. So AD 70 is when everything gets carried into the land. And so everything gets carried into the land. And that's when it gets applied. It didn't get applied. Things like sowing and reaping, for instance, didn't get applied in the in the wilderness had to wait till till you enter the land in order to for those yeah. for those um those precepts to take effect. So the thing where where preterists go off the rails is they assume that well once they get to the land they drop everything and then they have to start fresh. No, everything gets applied in the land. So Jesus Christ that's when his authority that's when his authority takes over. In fact, Moses is of course still in, for condemnation's sake is still, you know, the Ten Commandments is still very important, but we're not living by the Ten Commandments anymore. We're living by Christ's law, love thy neighbor as thyself, and by his um, his new law. And so I think that's, there's, a, there's a bit of um, a discu discussion that goes with that, but I'm just going to leave it right there because that's another totally different story, and I don't know you don't want to get into yeah. that. So go and I, well, I mean, just as a, you know, we go back along, a long ways. And and I, so I don't have to resort to all of this transition economy for, I, yeah. I don't have, see, I, I left, I left all that. I was raised dispensationalist and became full preterist and, and they operate under such black and white systematic, nice, neat bow tied charts and stuff. And that, that's just not the stuff of the Bible. But one thing is, and that's when Isaiah prophesies that death will be swallowed up forever. And that seems to me to be a one-time event. Um, but if you've got death swallowed up for a couple people and then a thousand years, and then it's really swallowed up. Um, see, you've got to introduce. Um, that's why I think Paul Preterists, the majority of them that I met uh, over the years that I spoke at the conferences, the majority of them were dispensationalists. They came out of dispensationalism. Preterism, that they, they, they goes hand in hand. It's, it's, it's uncanny how dispensationalism and full preterism both work hand in hand. That's why I, I left both of them completely. Um, so because they, they have to invent these periods of time that don't exist. The Bible knows of only two, would you say? And that is the present age and the age to come. No, I, I don't agree with that. Okay. Because Paul says um, in Ephesians, he says, talking about the mystery, he says, which in other ages was not made known yeah. until the sons of men is now revealed. So there's definitely different ages. I mean, even um, uh, even Charles Hodge and his, you know, systematic theology, he talks about different dispensations. Irenaeus talks about them. This has been a, a facet of theology from the very beginning, talking about different ages or different, different dispensations. And of course, I understand that, you know, uh, to, it's always easier to think, you know, two age, this age and the age to come, um, I think that's over oversimplifies the the issue. I think it's an oversimplistic way to approach it. And okay. just as I think, you know, you know, it's over like simplicity. Uh, say? Because I, I was raised in the massive complexity of dispensationalism, Clarence Larkin version. 
And and then I got into pole preterism and the just massive confusion that goes on there. Simplicity has become my number one rule. So, for example, when Jesus says, all who are in their tombs shall come out, the just and the unjust, and all who are given to me, I will raise in the last day. That's about as a no-brainer to me as you can get. What do you yeah. do? How do you deal with uh, Jesus's passages there and divide up the all and and, and well, shoot a thousand years in between them? Yeah, well, well, yeah. I mean, the the last day is the last the last thousand year thousand year day. Um, so when when um you know the seven days of creation, I believe once Adam sinned, I think he did sin on the sixth day. I think that triggered a redemptive week of seven 1,000 year days. Now, it doesn't mean that God can't shorten the days, but God has appointed 7,000 years, right? He's appointed 7,000 years for his program to be fulfilled. So the very, very length it can go is 7,000 years. Now, can he shorten days? Yes, he can. Can he come back right now? Yes, he can. But what I want to say here is that when he does come back, I believe there's going to be 1,000 years it's going to be the anti-type of Adam's um, incomplete millennium because he only lived, I believe, 930 years. And so Christ can have a complete millennium and the rulership and dominion that was given to Adam, which Adam through his sin forfeited, is going to be given to Christ and his saints, Christ and his bride. Um, so it's going to be a perfect anti-type of what would have happened, um, what should have happened had Adam obeyed God. I think that's that's the key right there. And of course, you know, Irenaeus, he talks about that. You know, the early church fathers, they talk about it. it was, it's a common theme. You know very well what they taught on those themes. Uh, yeah, but I, it, it is, it's not correct that the Achilleism was the dominant force um, in the second and third centuries. You can only refer to Charles Hill's work, Regnum Chylorum, for, for a thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly documented from every source on the subject. Um, that, that, you know, there was Killeism that existed, but it certainly by no means was the only stripe or fish in the sea when it came to, uh, what, and then eventually what won out, um, which was, which amillennialism, both in Eastern Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism, and the yeah. great majority of Protestantism, because amillennialism gave, it gives you, it gave that, that flexibility. So I'll, I'll ask one last question. Uh, one last question here. If Jesus came to fulfill prophecy and promises and all of this bunch of other stuff, what Old Testament promise gives us a thousand years? Well, the Old Testament promise that gives us a thousand years is, more, is probably going to be more typological than an expressly stated scripture. Mm -hmm. And that's fine because we can use, you can use typology and typology can, uh, can really explain and clear things up. And even, you know, Peter Lightheart and James Jordan, the typological maximalists of the Reformed Church would say, yeah, that's a good way. Of course, they would disagree with my interpretation of what of the symbolism and, and types and all of that. But I think it's something that that we need to look at. Um, you know, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. Moses even. I think I was reading somewhere that Moses might have been a, a premillennialist. I think that's taking it too far. But I think you could make the, make certain inferences from from Psalm 90. Yeah, yeah I know. Hey. Yeah. Um, and again, I, I've cautioned against the writings of Lightheart and both and, and James Jordan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my my gateway guys, uh, how I got into full preterism, just, you know, read James Jordan. It's not that hard. Uh, so. They, uh, so. Yeah, on, I, I'll just point out that on one hand, you talk about the, the, the perspicuity of Scripture and clearness of Scripture. And when I see all who are given to me, I shall not lose one of them. These are logical terms, all and yeah. one. When you see all and one in the same sentence, all that are given to me, I shall not lose one. Uh, and I will raise them up, the all and the one, mm -hmm. in the last day. That, right. The that's, last, me, that's a no-brainer. Last day is the last thousand years of human history. I'm, I'm glad John told us that in John 6. Yeah. I'm glad too. <laughs> or he doesn't. That's the thing. He doesn't. Anyway, I'm 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 done. Gentlemen, very good, professional, cordial first cross exam. Now we're gonna hand it to Phelan. You get to lead the way for equal time. And so again, the floor is yours, gentlemen. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so I guess the question that I really want to ask is. 
And I guess I kind of touched on this in my my presentation was, and, and this is a serious, you know, serious question, is, um, you know, Christ told his, his followers, he says, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. He's talking about his power, see, he's talking about his second coming. Now, if there has to be, if the, there has to be a thousand plus years, now it's 2000, right? It could possibly be 3000 because you guys say that the 1000 years is a not a not a literal number it's just a, a symbol right so if there could be 3000 4000 5000 10000 years before his coming then what sense did, did it make for him to tell his disciples to watch for his coming he's not telling them to watch for his coming he's telling them to watch out for deceivers and false christs and prophets and all the rest of it so i i'm alert all the time i'm being alert right now in in, in the current things that are going on in our culture be careful and be alert we can see how many Christians can just simply go astray because they they they're listening to other sources, they're listening to other things, and then they come away and they're astray. Uh, this this is the importance of my word shall not ever pass away. You want to know okay. the truth? You stick to the word of God. That's that's it. Um, okay, you won't so, go astray. <laughs> okay, I, I don't so, care what the science tells you. I don't care what the media tells you. I don't care what statistics. Tell, I I don't care. What the higher critical scholars tell me, I, I only care what the spirit speaking through the word of God says. That's it. Okay. Pay attention to my words. Be yeah, alert. Do not be okay. deceived. So Sam, so Sam, when he says, when he says that in, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse uh, 42, he says, watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Then he says in uh, verse 44, he says, therefore be also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. So he's telling his disciples to watch for his coming. But you're saying that the coming can't happen until the millennium ends first. And the millennium has already been going on for 2,000 years. So what I'm saying is, what, did, what sense does that make of Christ's admonitions to watch if you have this long period of 2,000 plus years, possibly 3,000, possibly 10,000, that has to end before Christ can come? Does that not... Uh, lay open to uh, lay open charges of possible confusion on the part of Christ, uh, confusion, contradiction, even falsehood. Uh, no, I, I think that uh, again, along with other uh, textual critics, that uh, there is the endure unto end of your life, and this is viewed as a death in the Lord, as in Psalms, also repeated again in Revelation. And that the Lord, the coming there is in reference to death. Uh, uh, this okay. is a, this is this is coming. So I, I'm standing with a, a a group of others that understand that Matthew is playing on two terms here, and one of them summed it up is the end of the age or the end of your life, whichever comes first. Pay attention. You do not know the hour when your Lord will come, and we know that that language is found again. And I love in the last 50 years, this return to rooting everything in the New Testament as understanding it, that it's it's basically Old Testament theology. And that's so our home in the New Testament is not some brand new invented revelations that nobody's ever heard of before and that are just falling out of the sky. No, Paul's <laughs> Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. He's teaching Judaism. He's teaching Tanakh. He's teaching the writings, the prophets and the Torah. That's what he's teaching. And the problem is, is that those who rejected him yet claimed that they were following Tanakh, they were not following Tanakh. If they were following Tanakh, you would follow me because Tanakh speaks of me. And so right. I love this scholarly return back because now we can read Jesus and understanding that, yep, yeah, I will come to you. I will come down and I will come and I will see. Well, we see that language going on all the time with Yahweh. And Jesus is asserting the same kind of thing. You do not know. When I will come, I can be you two are left in the field, one are in the field and one are not. I take one of them. I don't. This just yeah. happened to a friend of mine the other day. He died. He's my same age. And so my same age. And he died. OK. OK. So it's safe to say, would it be safe to say then that you think that Jesus Christ's admonitions uh, to watch for his coming? We're, we're to watch for our death. Is that what you're saying? I, absolutely. Okay, so when he says in, in Matthew, uh, Mark chapter uh, 13, he says, 
Uh, in verse 34, for the son of man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. He says, watch ye therefore, for ye know not what the master of the house cometh at even or at, uh, or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. What I say unto you, I say unto all watch. You're saying that he's talking about where he's talking about individual death. Yeah. I, for example, uh, this is fleshed out in, in Revelation. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars and, and, and who dwells in the midst of the seven candlesticks. Now, what are the seven candlesticks? That's the congregations. Well, what is he doing here? He's walking through them and he's saying, I will remove this. And then he finally he gets to the church in Theatira where he says here, so I will come and cast her on the bed of suffering and I'll make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent and I will kill her children dead. I will kill her children dead. So what's he doing there? I'm coming and I will come among you Theatirans unless you repent and I will kill some of your children. Yeah. Some of people are taking of the body of Christ and they're not discerning the body of Christ and that is why some of you are sick and some of you have died. Be very careful. The Lord walks in the midst. He knows, he sees, he hears, he searches your hearts. He knows every thought that you're thinking. So be careful what you're doing. See, this hit me like a ton of bricks. And I'm thankful that I found other biblical scholars that found it. Because what that means is when I get up in the morning, I have to watch what I say. I have to watch what I do. I have to watch my actions because he sees me. He's watching me. He knows my yeah. heart. He knows my thoughts. And I could, I could be having an adulterous sexual relationship. And, and, and Dylan, we know that this happens. Yeah. Careful I just don't. You, you do not know yeah. the day or the hour that your Lord comes. Sure, sure, sure thing. I just think uh, making death uh, the coming of the Lord, I think that's a mistake. And I, I've got a book back yeah, here. Now, it's now it is in Revelation. It, it's, yeah. it's right there. That's, a, that's really a liberal view. Some of her children. That's right, death. but that's not a new that's not a new view, really. That's that's a liberal view. I've got a book back there by Samuel Lee. It's called Eschatology. I don't care who wrote and, it. It's right there in Revelation three. I will but what I'm saying, yeah, but, but the point I'm the I point I'm making is that, her children. Yeah, but the point I'm making is he used that doctrine that the coming of the Lord is takes place at death to show, well, this is when our resurrection takes place. Oh, absolutely no. See, there, 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 oh, there, okay. There you're missing the okay, point okay, of what so Matthew is doing. And uh, if you go back to what I said is Matthew's plan is the ends. Right? The end of the age, which will deed yeah. her at the end of history in the last day, or the end of your life, whichever comes first. Be careful. Walk circumspectly. Have your wicks trimmed. Keep oil well, in your lamp. Do not be deceived. A, do not be let yeah, I don't know. I, I, think, I think that's or a stretch. It's really a stretch. That's I don't think anybody... The way the text reads. Well, the text is talking and about Matthew chapter alleviates all of these. It okay. alleviates all of these problems that dispensationalism and full preterism have harped upon. It re, it alleviates all those problems. No, I, I think. But when he's talking about in Matthew chapter twenty four, he's talking about his parousia because he says, uh, "But of that day and the hour knoweth no man, no not the angels of heaven, too. but my Father only." And then he says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And then he goes on to talk about, you know, the flood carrying them away, et cetera, et cetera. Two shall be in the field. And then he says in verse 42, oh, he says, right, watch right. therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. So you're saying that he's talking about his parousia. In what did he do to the uh, people in the days of Noah? What did he do to them? In the days of Noah? Yeah, what, what what happened to those well, people? That's, that's, what happened to the people that were not watching? Well, the people that were not watching got killed in the flood. Oh, that's, they died. <laughs> right. Yeah. In the days of Noah. Which we're living in the days of Noah. We've been living in the days of Noah. So what's the days of Noah? Eating, drinking, marrying, conducting business, yeah, giving in marriage, being given in marriage, doing okay. it this city, going to that city. You mean conducting me, business? Yeah. Let me let me move on to another question because that we've kind of exhausted that theme. So my question, my next question is very practical. So who's so who's the beast of Revelation chapter 13? The beast is every beast and no beast. Every beast and no beast. Okay. Yeah. So so do you believe it's that the 42, 
Okay. So do you believe that the 42 months is, is a literal 42 month period? No. Okay. You don't. No reason to. No, no, no reason. Any more to. than a thousand or five months, or some of you will be persecuted for 10 days uh, or five okay. months. There'll be local, you know, no, these, these are symbolic times. Each of them have the root in the old Testament. The 42 months is based upon a 360 perfect calendar year, which exists nowhere. No, no one operates on a 360 but John's revelation is 360. So perfect 360. So that right there tips me off that he's not dealing with actual literal time okay. in terms of calendrical chronos time. Okay. Rather, he's dealing with Kairos time. Okay. Which he That's says fine. Kairos Ingus, not Hakronos okay. Ingus, a Kairos. Okay. Ingus. Okay. I got I got another question though. So you said you were talking in your initial presentation, you were talking about um the first resurrection. I believe you said that that's when we die, right? That's no at death. Okay. I won't participate in the first resurrection until my body is raised. Okay. Yeah. So I right now have a part in the first resurrection. Oh, the you first have a part resurrection in the first takes place resurrection. at the end of the thousand years. So the first resurrection, then that's that's when the bodies are raised, and you have a part yeah. in the first resurrection now. Yeah. So you only have a little tiny, teeny tiny little part. That's what the word medos means. Okay. Well, we, we see, yeah, I understand. We see that differently, though. We, we talked about well, that a few different. moments ago. Word, we see, we see that differently. So, okay, so he says, well, they shall reign as, as priests and kings. So that's in the future tense, right? So when does that happen? Those who have gone on to be with the Lord, as Paul says, are with the Lord Christ. Well, what's Christ doing? He's ruling and reigning at the right hand of the Father. Well, what are they okay, doing so, with it? Well, they're ruling and reigning with it. So, I don't so, rule. By the way, I don't rule. This is where post-millennialists get all screwed up. I don't rule and reign here on earth. Anybody that thinks they're ruling and reigning here on earth is deceiving themselves. Please. Okay. Jesus it says, did not call us to rule and reign over politics in Washington, D.C. here on earth. Right. That's, that's not our mission. Okay. <laughs> but it says... It says, I believe it says in Revelation 5, it says that it made us unto our God's kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So this we is... We shall reign upon the earth, yes. Right. New heaven, the new earth. Okay. But he was talking about something that was coming up, right? And so this is something that, you know, the, the promise to Thyatira, right? He says, and I will give them power over the nations. And Absolutely. so there's still going to be nations. There's, there's, I don't see how you can make this an end of time... If uh, scenario if if you die if, if the the imagery of revelation is blessed are those washing their robes so you have to okay. wash your robes here on earth when you when you're when you die blessed are those who die in the lord for their works their deeds shall follow them well my deeds is what i'm going to be judged for at the resurrection in the last right. day well if i die and go to heaven i'm with christ my body is still on earth but i am with christ and Christ is ruling and reigning over the nations. And so I will rule okay. and reign over the nations. But that's purely gotcha. heavenly. That has okay. nothing to do okay. with with, uh, with voting for Donald Trump so that the evangelical power base can maybe get rid of abortion. And yay, we're okay. ruling for Jesus Christ. Right. Okay, well, I got another question. Pardon. Sam, I got another question, if you please. So in Isaiah chapter 65, where he says, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered. And then he talks about, he says, uh, there shall no, no more be an events uh, an infant of days or an old man that hath not filled his days for the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be a curse. So there's sin and death in this state. You're saying this is the eternal state? Yeah. There's an eternal and, and state. Isaiah, Isaiah, in, I, Isaiah is picturing that, and this is Jewish. Isaiah is picturing uh, the language that he's using and that he's borrowing there is Deuteronomy. Uh, Torah, and then he's borrowing Genesis uh, two and three. Oh, he's borrowing. It's, it's his. It's Torah. It's it's the, it's the language of covenant. Torah. So Genesis two, three, and then also there's a few passages in Deuteronomy, the blessings passages. He's dealing with what Isaiah is doing, what the Holy Spirit is showing him, and what he's writing down as as he's being shown is a perfect state, uh, perfect blessings, the blessings on earth, and they'll be perfect. They'll be they'll they'll be perfect. And so in usage of the language, um, an infant that dies at a hundred, well, that's, that's, that's perfection. He's not saying, oh, an infant's going to die at a hundred any more than a tree is going to live a life. 
you have to read the language in its covenantal context. Okay, but it says 28. Okay. Okay, but it goes on and it says, and they shall build houses and inhabit them. I, and I they plan shall on creating and building in the new heaven and new earth. Yeah. This is this is taking place in what you call the eternal state. So it's still a system where life goes on, right? People are are uh, what are you, well, are you, do you think that we're gonna sit around in clouds with harps on our and, and for the rest of our lives? Well, I want to know what you think. I think we're going to be building and creating and the and and, okay. and and adventures in the cosmos and creations of what we think sending a Hubble telescope up. Oh, we've seen the outer. We ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> we, okay. we're, well, what I, God has know, planned for us in his creation and yeah, for I, human I beings to reach the full potential of who they are, yeah. of which we're only just having part of. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think we're just going to be a lot more. We're going to be sitting on clouds of harp for eternity. Right. I, I think there's going to be. That? If that's the promise, you can have it. You know, I yeah, know. I think there's going to be a lot more for us to do. But remember, you made a big deal about death being the ending. You quoted the little apocalypse of Isaiah. And now yeah. I, I quote Isaiah. There's a pas passage where death and sin still exist. And you say, oh, well, that's just perfection. Well, wait a minute. That's not perfection. That shows that when this happens, death is still going to exist. And sin is well, still going the, to exist. But the premillennialists can't have that because when do the new heavens and earth come, Brian? Well, After the millennium okay, so, or before the millennium or during okay, the millennium? So, so I believe, okay, so, well, let, let me when answer that. When does see the new heaven? Okay. And new earth? That's a good one. So my, my understanding is the new he heaven and new earth is synonymous with the times of restitution. And that's times, right? So it starts with the thousand years and then there's after the thousand years. So, and this is something which you could trace this all the way back to Irenaeus. He actually quoted no, Isaiah agree. 65 as pertaining to the times of the kingdom. And of course, John Gill, there's his commentary. If you if you read John Gill's Body of Divinity, I've read he, places, he, yeah. he makes, yeah, he makes the, the new heaven and new earth synonymous with the millennium. So I believe the new heaven and new earth starts with the millennium, but there is a dispensation in scripture, which represents a state of things, which is way better than this, but which yet cannot be an eternal state because there's still, there's still, there's still enemies because there's still things to, to do. There's still nations to subdue. There's still death. There's still sin. And so all of these passages, our millennials will typically spiritualize and will say, well, since these passages, they, they involve Israel and Israel's restoration. Well, what does it have to do with us? Let's just spiritualize these passages and then make the next thing, boom, we enter our beautiful new heavens and new earth. But what about all these passages that speak of a better, a better state in a better condition of worldly affairs, uh, but which yet cannot possibly okay. be understood. I'll, I'll give you that, but uh, okay. let, let's, go, let's go literal then. Let, we'll go literal. Okay. We'll, we'll say the thousand years, that is is literal, and Jesus, he's over there in, in Jerusalem and stuff, and we can call him up on the telephone, and there he is. And, and But Isaiah 65 states here, um, I will create Jerusalem to be a delight. Uh, I will be a delight, my people. Now, Let's let, let's literalize this next verse. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. Yeah. So for a thousand years, there will be no weeping or crying. Well, no, I think there'll be no weeping and crying in the city, in Jerusalem. I didn't None. say in the whole wide world, does it? No. Oh, so this doesn't apply to the whole wide world. Then. The new heavens and new earth well, are only in Jerusalem. Well, no, the new heavens and new earth have as their capital Jerusalem. I believe the passages you're referring to. What, what, what passage are you referring to? It's Isaiah 65, 19. Okay, let me, let me look. But then it says never again. So it's very strong in Hebrew. Yeah. It says never right here, again. it says, I will, re will, there be I will an rejoice. An for a few days. Okay, so but it no says, I will rejoice. The same, you're not letting me answer. I said, it says, uh, and I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in, in joy in my people. And the my voice people. of weeping shall be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. So he's talking about Jerusalem, the rest of the earth. I don't know. There's probably going to be some weeping and crying going on. Uh, but of course, among the enemies, I think. But when is the weeping and the crying ended in Isaiah 25? Okay, so what passage are you talking about now? When death is swallowed up forever in victory, and I will wipe away all their tears, and I, they shall not better be no more weeping or crying. So it, it's obvious that Isaiah 25 is directly connected right here to Isaiah 65. Okay, so, okay, good, good, good. So it says he's talking about in this mountain, 
the face of the cover and cast over all people in the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory. In this mountain, death will be swallowed up in victory, but not in the rest of the world. So I believe in wow. this mountain, in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, so there Jesus will be only no partially more swallows up death. I'm sorry? So Jesus only partially swallows up death. Well, he swallows up death. Yeah, he partially swallows. He partially swallowed up death when he rose from the dead. Okay. He defeated death. He, vic he, he was I victorious. I think that's nonsense, but what, I don't see any scripture that says he partially will swallow up death. But whatever. Well, in the sense, okay, so in the sense of, of doing it on behalf of his own self, right? So he rose from the dead. He defeated death, right? But it wasn't a total defeat. It wasn't a defeat, say, of the of every, of every man, child of Adam. So then when the, when the first fruits, first fruits, right, then there's going to be a harvest. And then the harvest is when he swallows up death for his people. So in this mountain, he will make a feast uh, for all people, a feast of fat things. And then, of course, at the very end, you have Gog and Magog coming from four quarters, right, coming against the camp of the saints. And so those nations, those Gog and Magog nations are still going to be around uh, during the millennium. And they're the ones that come against the camp of the saints, so again, so basically, that's, the thousand years is the start of the new heavens and the new earth, which culminates in the massive war of end all wars that we've never seen of all these nations, I guess, that are weeping and crying surrounding Jerusalem that can't get into it. Now, and, now then, you, now you, and then, and then God's really going to swallow up death forever. And then there'll be a full new heavens and new earth, wherein there literally will be no more dying in it whatsoever. In any well, way, shape, or form, is that basically your view? Well, well, Sam. Even Ken Gentry talks about in one of his books. He talks I don't, about new creation. I don't care what Ken Gentry says. He I talks really about don't. new creation gradualism. Right. He Good calls it, where it's things don't just happen. You know, slam bang. They happen in, in stages. And so, of course, he thinks that this happened. This has started in, in AD seventy. I would say no, no, no. It's going to start at the second That's coming. True. But it's the same same principle. It's called gradualism because. This phrase, new creation, is also used in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's used of the individual, and the individual is regenerated, but yet has a further you stage keep of resurrection. you got to keep bringing in these ideas of progressivism so, and gradualism yeah, and, progressive. and, and, and all, these, all these things that nowhere is mentioned in Paul, but they're inventions of men because we have to make them fit our no, system. No, no. It's, it's, a, it's a solid fact when Paul said you, you are a new creation. He wasn't talking about a post-redemptive reality. He was talking about redemptive reality, but not a post-redemptive reality because we still await our resurrection. We're not completely redeemed yet. So it's not a post-redemptive reality. When he says new heavens and new earth, doesn't we use the part. definite article, never uses the definite article that says new heavens and new earth. He's talking about a new state. And it's a new state that can be, it can either be the millennium in some passages, or it could be the, the state after the millennium. But it's a times of restitution. That's why times is plural, because it's not just talking about one period. It's talking about thousand years, and then it's talking about after the thousand years. So okay. it's, again, you know, you just have to, you have to, this way you have to rightly divide the word, because oh, if yeah. you just lump everything together, and say, or, you know, all talking about the same thing, that's, that's, that's going to lead you into there. error, so. I, I, I will just end with, I think that the theology that's being uh, brought up by, by, by many wonderful uh, women and, and, and men, uh, biblical scholars, is to make sure our theology is uh, rooted in the scriptures. And because what we've done in the West is we've brought in all of these uh, progressivism, uh, gradualism, and all of these foreign concepts, none of which are in the Bible, by the way, but we, and, and we've been, and it's just it's run amok so that's why i hang out in the hebrew scriptures more than i do even in the in the greek but i, I read more of, of the hebrew because i'm trying to assimilate what's going on there because what jesus said is that i am i if, if you read them you'll understand who i am so i ask my students before a question uh do you need the new testament to preach jesus christ and they looked at me like i was uh from another planet but paul did <laughs> i'll leave you with that one can you preach the gospel from the Hebrew scriptures? I guess, I suppose you could if you knew which ones to preach, but this is where the New Testament becomes necessary in rightly partitioning which scriptures apply today and how they are to be applied today. So okay. I think the New Testament is necessary. You just can't take the Old Testament and just, 
walk out into the street. If you got to know your stuff first, so you have to have some, uh, you have to have some learning in the, the in the problem. New, yeah. The problem yeah. is we don't read our Hebrew Old Testament. We're not reading it. We're not reading our Old Testament. We should be. I'm reading my Old Testament. I read my Old that's, Testament that's every day. Yeah, but anyway, gentlemen, very good. Uh, that cross exam flew by about 50 minutes. Very professional and engaging. Lots of great questions and answers. And I have to go paint the church tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take the it easy, never ends, right? My night's not over yet. So, gentlemen, to be fair, let's give you both a real quick closings, though, just so we at least have time to engage super chat questions. Sure. So, Sam, we're going to hand it over to you. And take two to three minutes just for a closing statement, a summary. Uh, go ahead, Sam. Yeah, I, I uh, my view, and uh, as I typed it up and I was reading again through uh, Isaiah 24, through uh, which, which, which really is such a wonderful block in Isaiah because it encapsulates everything else that's going on in Isaiah, all the buzzwords. And it's interesting uh, that it's right in the middle, too. It's just right there. And there's there's a there's a reason uh, why for that. And a lot of Old Testament uh, works, you'll see that, uh, as Dr. Dwayne Christen, Christensen stated, the riddle is in the middle. Uh, Hebrew just has this way of going to the middle. You see this in Revelation, too. You see it, for example, we finished our study of the Gospel of Mark, and right in the middle is transfiguration. That's, you know, read everything up to transfiguration and then everything after transfiguration, because that's who Jesus is. He's, he's the Daniel 713 guy. So when you know who that is, you know, you can go through there. Um, my whole thing on Revelation uh, is that it's thoroughly, 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 thoroughly rooted in the inspired Hebrew scriptures that the Holy Spirit, who is showing and revealing these things to John, and he's simply hearing them and then writing it down. Um, he's or seeing it in some ecstatic mode of whatever state the Holy Spirit does there uh, to a person, either literally seeing angels, I believe in angels, or or somehow in his mind and mental state, ecstatic state, God is showing him these visions and he's literally writing them down as he's seeing and, and what he's hearing. And what he's seeing and, and hearing is Tanakh. He's hearing Torah. He's hearing the blessings and the cursings. He's hearing the prophets. He's hearing the writings. He's hearing the Psalms. He's hearing Ecclesiastes. He's hearing Job because the spirit of God inspired the Hebrew scriptures and Jesus is the fullness of these scriptures. And this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the only apocalypse you need to read. Forget all the other Jewish ones. Forget Enoch. Forget fourth Esdras. Forget second Esdras. Forget all these other apoc These apocalypses are worthless compared to this one right here. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ given to one of his holy apostles. And so I think it's thoroughly rooted in then the scriptures that the holy apostles were reading or what Paul calls the hagiographer in Romans chapter one and verse three. He refers to it as the holy writings, which is the Tanakh. It's the scriptures. That's what he's reading. And Jesus is the light of that through the Holy Spirit is what is being done here. So naturally, when we read Revelation, which has so many allusions, particularly Psalm two, which is the reign and rule of Messiah Jesus at the right hand of the father he's ruling and reigning with a rod of iron and he's smashing the nations so what's been going on over the last two thousand years it looks like a lot of nation smashing is going on to me that's what it looks like what else does it look like uh, wars yep uh what else persecutions yep uh how about famines yep how about plagues yep how about uh, people falling away from the from the faith or claiming that they claiming that they follow Jesus, but they really don't. Have we seen any of that in the last, from the ascension of Christ onwards? Have we seen any of that in the last 1900 years? Yeah. Do we see any today? Yep. How about plagues? Have we seen any plagues? Yeah. We're going to see some more too. How about earthquakes? Any earthquakes? Yep. Has anything changed? Now, in the Old Testament, what are famines, earthquakes, plagues, death, destruction, violence, war, just unheard of violence? What is that called in the Old Testament? The wrath of God. And now all power and authority has been given over to the man, Christ Jesus. A man is ruling. A man has all power and authority, and he's ruling with a rod of iron. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. 
It always has been. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, be careful how you walk. The Lord watches all things and you will give an account for every word that's come out of your mouth, for everything that you've done. You are going to stand before God. And I weep. <clears throat> I weep saying this. You will stand before God and give an account for every thought, word, and deed that you've done. And you have to ask yourself, the wrath of God and the Lamb, who can stand? Who can stand the scrutiny of God? That's, that's what the message is. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Now, we get off on these things like a thousand years and all this. And it's all lively. Debate. And I love my brother, Brian. I've known him two decades now, I think. And we've always gone back and forth like this. And that's all good because we're not in a perfect state yet. Iron sharpens iron. Blown back and forth through every wind of doctrine and this, that, and the other. Hopefully, the Holy Spirit will guide us all through this. And so, it is debatable. It is legitimate to have premillennialism. I have many premillennial brothers that I that have done far more than I've ever done in my little pinky. So, I don't castigate all of that. Theology is, is good and fun, and it encourages us to do and to continue to study the scriptures and to continue to exalt and follow Jesus Christ. Because that bottom line, I know Brian's heart and he knows mine, is I want to exalt and glorify Jesus Christ, who has saved a wretch like me and has done things through me that I never thought would ever be done or accomplished. And so all glory, praise, and honor be to the Lamb of God. And I know that my brother would say the same, as well as let's include Donnie uh, Badensky in this as well. But that's, that's it. Very good, Sam. I appreciate that. Uh, closing statement. This is an in-house debate, and I appreciate the brotherly love coming from Sam. Absolutely. And Phelan. God bless. Okay, so uh, Phelan, we'll hand it over to you for a closing statement. We'll give you equal time as well, brother. So you get six minutes, and the floor is yours. Go ahead. Okay, thanks, Sonny. This has been a really great debate. I always appreciate interacting with Sam. I remember, I think I first interacted with him, I think it might have been in 2007 when we met over at D.D. Warren's blog. It was called Preterist Blog. And we used to, there was a lot of rapid fire going on over there and we probably exchanged some, uh, some, some crossfire. But I remember Sam and I remember having some good discussions with him back in the day. And then, of course, I heard that he had left full preterism around 2011. And during that time, I was I was really busy. I had taken a hiatus from apologetics and I just, just was so burned out on apologetics and I never had a chance to congratulate him. But of course, every once in a while I weigh in and I, you know, post a comment on his blog or whatever. So I appreciate his work. I appreciate all that he's done. I think he's a great scholar. Of course, we have uh, differences of opinion as, as regards the millennium. And I think this is something that, like Sam said, this has been going on for so long and it's, it's still an in-house debate though. Right. So we're not saying, you know, that the resurrection, uh, that this physical death was not uh, part of Adam's fall. We're not saying that the virgin birth is a, is a myth. We're not saying that the Trinity is a, is a hoax. We're not saying we're still Christians. This is a Christian in-house debate. And I think that's the way that this needs to be handled. Um, on the other hand, you've got people that are saying, well, you know, uh, the virgin birth is a myth and, you know, this death was never a uh, consequence of the fall. And so you've got a lot of problems out there. And so uh, I appreciate the fact that I can engage with Sam, that we can have such, I don't want to say vehement because that's not the word, but we can have such a pronounced disagreement about certain major, major themes and major doctrines. And yet at the same time, maintain a note of amity and brotherhood in the midst of it. Um, I would say, though, that I don't, I, of course, I don't disagree that we're in a dispensation of, of wrath right now. I think God's wrath is certainly uh, still prominent in this dispensation. And I think we're really just, uh, I think that the, the solution is to get back to the word of God, even as Sam said, get back to your Hebrew scriptures. Of course, I don't read, you know, I read a little, I've read a little bit of Hebrew, but I have to work my way up to that. And I just don't have the time. I read the new, uh, the King James version. And I do a little interlinear work as well. But um, I think reading the Old Testament scriptures is really important because the one thing I've noticed in debates of this kind is, and not every debate, but a lot of them, is there's a lot of biblical illiteracy. And I think the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures are really important. It's important to get grounded in those so we can understand the, uh, the backdrop of the New Testament scriptures. So I agree with Sam 100%. And I just want to say that I really enjoyed this debate. 
And I really enjoy what Sam brought to the table. I also enjoy, I want to thank Donnie for uh, hosting this debate. It's been a real pleasure, guys. And I thank you and I hope both of you have a wonderful holiday season. And I think Donnie, Donnie may have ducked out. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much all I have. And I guess I could say, okay, so what I'll do is I'll talk about just a little a little something else. Bill, and, we're good. Uh, if you're if you're good okay. to go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's okay. That's okay. You're taking a break. That's fine. That's what I thought. <laughs> Because you had six minutes, I thought I could. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Break. I didn't want to start. You know, I didn't want to start arguing again. <laughs> oh, that was a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's fine. Okay, gentlemen. Well, uh, it's been great. You, you need to, you need to learn how to take spiritual bathroom break. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, gentlemen. Well, what we'll do is jump right into a fast-paced Q and A because I know we have a bit of a time limit tonight for this debate. Yeah. And so what we'll do, gentlemen, as you know, you both have been here before. We usually go, you know, whoever the question's for gets the last word. So if the question's for Phelan, then he would get the last word. With the, with uh, our strict time limit tonight, let's do this. Whoever the question's for, so say, like, this is going to be for you, Sam. You can respond. And then uh, Phelan, you could quickly respond. Let's say a minute, then we'll move on to, to the next sure. question. So one response each, basically. Okay, okay. Sam, uh, this, this comes in from Born Again RN. $20 super chat. I appreciate the support, oh. Steve. So he says, <clears throat> Dr. Frost, since Revelation 2, actually, he makes a correction. He means, let me see here, Revelation 20, verse 2, begins the thousand years when Satan is bound and ends in verse 7 when he is released. Doesn't that support a literal 1,000 plus chilio? Translated, totally. one thousand is always literal in the NT. Any thoughts, Sam? No, it's not always literal. Um, it's not literal anywhere where I can find it. Um, you know, so I, I think that what's going on there is Psalm ninety. That's you know, thinking Jewish. The first thing when I hear a thousand years, first thing I'm going to is the and Psalm ninety is the Psalm of Moses. So I believe that Moses wrote that Psalm. Um, so. And it's a commentary on Genesis 3. So the language is unmistakable, Genesis 3. So um, a thousand years of the day, Lord, as an evening and or as in a morning. And so what Second Peter, what Peter's doing uh, here um, is that he's relating a thousand years and what God has been doing and what he is now doing and will do. But then he relates this idea of a thousand years to God specifically. And then right after he does this, he mentions new heavens and new earth, or we look forward to a new heavens and new earth. So whatever, so very, I think that's what John is being shown is a thousand years. That's the present time, a thousand years of the day. And he's not hearkened, he's not slack concerning uh, keeping his promises. In other words, endure tribulation, endure when it looks like God's nowhere around or near you. It looks like everybody else is just Christianity is on the way out and you're the last Christian standing. Endure because the day in the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. What does that mean? New heavens and new earth are coming. New heavens and new earth are coming. Keep hope alive, as Jesse Jackson would say. But I think that's what Peter's saying. Keep hope alive when everybody else around you is leaving. Because remember, God is not slack concerning his promise. What is the promise? new heavens and new earth. And that, that, that's what in Second Peter 3. So right there you have a thousand years, one text with a thousand years in it and new heavens and new earth. And then Revelation 20, Revelation 21, there it is. And um, that's, I just, that's the way I see it. I appreciate it, Sam. Feeling over to you. Yeah, I mean, I believe it's a thousand literal years. I think that's a good point. I mean, I don't think there's any reason to take it as a, as a symbolic period of, you know, any other length of time other than a thousand. I think it's pretty clear. And as a matter of fact, there's a lot of views out there, classic Christian views that start the thousand years, you know, with Constantine and then ends them sometime in the dark ages. There's other views, which there's still views within, you know, reformed and uh, more, um, amillen I say amillennial, but they're more reformed views that do take the thousand years as a literal period of time. Even I think Geneva, the Geneva Bible does that. But so the thousand years, the fact that the thousand years are literal is not simply a 
a, um, an interpretation foisted upon the evangelical world by premillennialists. It's also latent in other uh, reformed and postmillennial systems, I think, even adopt some of those views. So anyways, yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a viable view. Okay, thank you, gentlemen, for the responses. Next one comes in from SoCal Preston. Appreciate the support. This one, he says, is for both. So what we'll do this time around, Phelan, we'll start with you. That way Sam can have the last word for question two. So SoCal Preston, thank you for the support and question. He asks, when will Daniel 11 and 12, specifically verses 44 to 45 and 1 to 2, take place? No mention of a thousand-year Messiah reign in chapters 11 and 12 at the end or start of the thousand years question mark feeling we'll start with you go ahead yeah so uh so so daniel chapter 11 verses uh 45 and uh daniel chapter 12 verse 1 i believe that takes place when and well antiochus was a type and so i think sometimes in prophecy if you uh read a prophecy where it talks about a type for the anti-type. So I think the, you know, you could uh, go back to Isaiah chapter seven, you know, where he's talking about a near, uh, a near local fulfillment, whereas he said, you know, the, the details of the fulfillment are predicated actually of the anti-type. So he's saying, well, Antiochus is going to do all this stuff. At that time, there's going to be a, uh, Michael's going to stand up. And of course, there's going to be a time of trouble for Israel. Well, as Antiochus was actually a shadow type and so what we're looking at is we're looking at the beast who, of whom, of course, uh, who, uh, who um, Antiochus shadowed is actually going to fulfill that prophecy. As far as there being, uh, he says, no mention of a thousand year Messiah reign in chapter 11, 12. I don't think, yeah, I mean, there's no mention in most of the prophecies. There's no mention of a literal thousand years. I mean, I'll, I'll admit that. It's mentioned in uh, Revelation chapter 20, though, and that's where we where we start having to harmonize and, and calibrate our, our, um, our prophetical views according to what John, or according to what Christ reveals to John in his very last communication to the church. So I think that's important. And I think that we need to take that. And if there is a thousand years mentioned, I think that we should flesh it out through deeper study. Thank you, Phelan. Dr. Sam Frost, floor is yours. Go ahead. Well, I, uh, the first part I would agree with, uh, with what was said that it's referring to um, Antiochus IV or Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, 1145 is referring to him. I don't see where Daniel's talking about any typology or uh, quadruple fulfillments or anything. It's, 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 it's fairly clear. Uh, this is stated about Antiochus throughout, uh, beginning in chapter seven, uh, the language of he will meet his doom um, with no one to meet him or Rather, uh, uh, he will um, he, he will meet his end. He will come to his end. That, that's Daniel seven. That's Daniel eight, and then it's uh, brought up again here. So it's talking about the same guy, and all throughout. So uh, then, uh, get rid of these chapter markers and verses. Get rid of that because they don't exist. Uh, the next verse is is a, is a very clear time marker, and at that time, so that's a very clear time marker. So when the text uh, uh, states "who by et ir," when it states that, that that's anaphoric, and at what time? Well, when the when this king dies, and at that time, uh, there's no it's it's an immediate. Re I mean, this is standard uh, uh, standard Hebrew. So when at that time, so what's going to happen? All right, uh, great prince Michael. So that's now we're in the invisible world. This this is Michael, the great prince, who's who's an angel. We've already met, you know, Gabriel and the Watchers and Daniel and the angels. Daniel, he's seeing myriads of angels. One like a one like a son of a god's is in the fire with him. So Daniel's one of these books that's giving you a little peek into the behind the scenes world. So there will be a time of tribulation, such as not happened from the beginning of the nations. Um, and that's a bad translation. I'm reading NIV there. The Hebrew uh, rather reads from the beginning of this nation until then. So it's talking about the beginning of Israel as a nation. And they've had a lot of tribulations. And here's going this this tribulation is going to be a real, real bad one. And it was. It's Antiochus Epiphanes. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name found written in the book, 
will be delivered. And they were. You know, we know, just read first and second Maccabees. They, they were delivered. Hanukkah was a result of it, which just celebrated. Um, now, these people found written in the book, what's going to happen to them? Well, those who sleep in the dust of the earth, some to everlasting life. Some will be raised to everlasting life. Some of these Jews that remained faithful during the time of the death of this king, their names are written in the book of life. What's going to happen to them? They're going to be raised from the dead. When? Daniel doesn't tell me that. All he tells me is that you people who stay faithful during the death and the time of this king, who's going to come to his end, and if you stay faithful to that through the tribulation that's coming your way in that time, your name's written in the book of life. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. When everything else is all around you is losing theirs, stay faithful to the covenant. That's what Daniel's all about. Stay faithful to the covenant, to the word of God. Don't listen to anybody else around because you do not know the day or the hour the Lord will come. Stay faithful. If you fear and shrink back because of death, Antiochus Epiphanes killed a lot of Jews, by the way. Now, what do you do in the face of the situation when you're facing death? Well, maybe the gymnasium doesn't look so bad. <laughs> maybe a compromise a little here. God won't mind. So oh, he minds. Your name is not written in the book of life. That's the promise. And that's what Daniel's talking about. Then. And no, there's no thousand years there either. Okay, gentlemen, appreciate the responses on that one. Next one comes in from Anthony Aquino. Thank you so much for the super chat. And the Anthony. question looks like he's coming at you, Sam. So let's see what he's Anthony. got for you. <laughs> so he says, Sam, since you are Amil, surely you can quote or name with a definitive reference one adherent of Amil okay. in the first or second century. He also says, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you as well, Anthony. Sam, go ahead. Why would I need to do that? Uh, what was there like? Was there like 10 Christians in the first and second century? We have all, you know, but yeah, I can read. I would uh, recommend, Anthony, that you read Regnum Kylorum by Charles Hill. There were certainly others around. Even Irenaeus uh, refers to others who are Orthodox, uh, who are not uh, Kilius, like he was. And then he refers to the Gnostics. So it's, he's referring to two groups of people. One group who are Orthodox, he says, who are Orthodox, uh, who do not agree with his Kiliism. And then he refers to those who go a step further. And there he's talking about the Valentinians and the, the Marcionites and some others. Um, so was there views prevalent that were not Kilius, that were Orthodox, that were not premillennial or whatever? Oh, absolutely. But I would I'd recommend you read his books. I'm not going to go down a list of, of uh, those that are out there. I mean, uh, Clement of Alexandria. Uh, we've got uh, First Clement, Barnabas. I mean, like Shepherd of Hermas. We can go down the we can go down the list. But I'm not. You know, that's neither here nor there. Sam, appreciate it. Feeling floor is yours. Go ahead. Yeah, that's a that's a good point, Anthony. And Merry Christmas to you and your family. I think that. Uh, I don't think there was any uh, amillennialists prior to Augustine. I think they were all pretty much. Now, there were some that, that didn't quite accept the, the book of Revelation as, as canonical, or maybe they didn't know about the book of Revelation. I think that may be where the issue comes in. I think it was Justin Martyr that actually said that there be some among the Orthodox that don't accept this doctrine. I know it wasn't Irenaeus, so I've read Irenaeus over and over and over again. But anyways... Uh, yeah, I, don't, I couldn't find any either. But uh, what I did find was I found a very detailed account of the millennium and the doctrine of the millennium in the writings of Irenaeus. And he said that, you know, some uh, some do are ignorant of the plan of salvation as it pertains to the resurrection. And of course, this is one of the reasons why he wrote book five was to show not only that the flesh would rise again, but also to show the order of resurrection and to show the manner of the entering of the kingdom and all of that. And then the new heavens, the final new heavens and new earth. So yeah, that's pretty much a given. Okay, gentlemen, very good. Appreciate the responses, Anthony. Thank you for the support. So we've got another one here from SoCal Preston. $5 super chat, appreciate it. This time it's for you, Phelan. So we'll start with you. He says, Paul opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Acts 14, verse 27, not Peter. Paul added to Peter in Galatians 2. How would this view of Paul 
refute Sam. Okay, so I take the I take the view that Peter actually had to Peter was given the keys, right? So he used the keys once on the day of Pentecost, and then he used the keys once on the on the uh, on the uh, when he went to the house of Cornelius. So, um, and then we can go back to Acts fifteen too. But anyways, you're asking how would this view of Paul refute Sam? So Paul added to Peter in Galatians chapter two. I guess I don't really understand the question. Paul added to Peter in Galatians chapter two. I don't know. Um, I, I don't think Paul really spoke anything different from what Peter spoke during the first part of his ministry. I think he joined his testimony to that of the 12 apostles. I think it was during, I think it was after Acts 28, particularly that he bring, he begins to bring in the new economy because that's when Israel's kingdom program began st started to ramp down. And then Paul was setting things up for an intermediate economy. And this is why things get, the tone and tenor of his teachings completely change after Acts 28. And so it's no longer about the kingdom coming down to earth in uh, you know Israel's kingdom program. It's about a long period during which the church, God would manifest, Christ would manifest himself through the church. And so the church age, yeah, I agree with, with SoCal that the church age begins with the epistles of Paul, but I think de facto the church age begins on the day of Pentecost. I think the Jews were the church. I think the church started with the Jews, and I think it's going to end with the Jews, and I think this present calling here is an intermediate uh, program. I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Phelan. Sam, floor is yours. Go ahead. I, I just respond that it doesn't. <laughs> I, I I don't, you know, it's 530. Okay, go to the Gentiles now. I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just, that's just, that's like, that, that, uh, again, uh, Cretans and Arabs were there in, in receiving. That's what it says. Those who were Jews and non-Jews in Acts chapter two, it says that, uh, Philip is going to an Ethiopian. Ethiopians are not Jews. Sorry, but they're not. And then you have the vision of Peter. Now let's go back a step further. Jesus said to his disciples before he ascended, go to the Gentiles. He's, he's, and, and then he's the, the centurion, who's a Roman. He's not Jew. He stands at the cross and he says, surely this man is the son of God. What's that? What is, what is the text? The Syrian woman. What's Matthew doing here? Why does he refer to the sign of Jonah who goes to Goyim? He goes to the Goyim, the Assyrians, the pig people. He goes to these people of all people. Gentiles. What's the mission of Israel? Gentiles. Save the world. Salvation to the world. Be a light to the world. So when did that stop? That was their mission. That's what they were doing. Why is it that you find in the prophets half of it is written to Moab, Ammon, the Hittites, the Assyrians. What the heck does Assyrians got to do with anything? Well, they have to do with everything. Read Genesis 10. I will bless all the nations and the families of the earth that bless you. What families of the earth and nations? What are you going to bless, Abraham? Who are you going to bless? Genesis 10. It's followed by Genesis 12. You got to read Genesis 10. That's the nations. Anyway, I'm done. Appreciate it, Sam. So this one comes in from Lazarus Calmly. I think it's a just a oh, Lazarus. quick follow up to <laughs> to a previous question from Anthony. So, gentlemen, if you had any thoughts on it, feel free to engage it. He says Justin's dialogue with T says Amil exists and brothers. Trifo, any thoughts on that? Justin's dialogue with Trifo, the Jewish. Mm. Go yeah, it was right, it was the right, dialogue right. with Trifo that uh, where he actually said, "Well, those accounted among the Orthodox." Well, the Orthodox might not have accepted the Book of Revelation. For instance, if you read the Scriptures without the Book of Revelation, you may very well conclude that the next thing on the menu is the new heavens and new earth. But of course, and I could get into light footed what the what the Jewish teachers taught during the during the second century century Judaism, but. Um, 
it's clear to me that the reason why Jesus Christ unveiled these truths concerning the millennium is because he wanted the church to be fully informed about this thousand year period and then to calibrate that revelation with the rest of revelation. And so again, regardless of what Justin Martyr might've written, um, I still think it's important to keep the, the full body of revelation in mind and to make sure that we are reading the book of revelation and that we're learning from it. And uh, that's pretty much my answer to that. Okay. I would just quote uh, what Ryan just said. There is an astonishing admission. Without the book of Revelation, you may conclude that resurrection and new heavens is the next thing on the menu. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Sure. And, uh, and then, I'll like I said, I'm I, done. Believe, I'm I done. believe a thousand years, it includes the thousand years. But no, no eternal death and sin in the new economy forever and ever and ever. So yeah, right, right. I believe in that. That's, we're not there yet at all in any right. sense. Yeah. All right, gentlemen. I'm I want to respect. I'm not in the new heavens and new earth right now at all in any sense. Oh, I agree. I agree. Yeah. We all agree on that, brothers. Yes, Amen. sir. No way. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to respect your time. So what we'll do is one last question. Yeah, and then we'll wrap it up for the night. This has been a, a good exchange, good professional. I, I can feel the heat of my wife right now as I'm speaking. Yes, yeah, so we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna uh, wrap it up on a good note from a question from the apologetic dog. So oh, Jeremiah, yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it. Now he's coming at you, feeling. So here we go. Oh, yeah. So okay. he says, <laughs> since premillennialism has death occurring after Christ's return during the thousand year reign. Please explain oh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 23 to 26. That seems to say that death will be destroyed at the second coming. He says, thanks. Thank you, Jeremiah. Go ahead, Phelan. Yeah, so in, um, <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, uh, verse 22, it says, For as in Adam all die, even in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his parousia. And then, after the parousia, then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. So the wicked, the resurrection of wicked are really mentioned. But he says, after the parousia, I believe the parousia lasts for a thousand years. So after the parousia, that's when he puts down all rule, all authority, all power, and that's when he delivers the kingdom to the Father. That's how I've viewed it. Of course, there's other translations and there's other views, but I think then refers to the nearest antecedent, which would be the parousia. They that are Christ at the parousia, they're raised, and then after the parousia, so after this thousand-year presence of Christ on earth, then come at the end when he shall have put down all rule, all authority, and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemy under his feet. And then it says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So then, of course, when the wicked, when the rest of the dead are raised, that's when death is cast into the lake of fire. Appreciate it, feeling. Sam, floor is yours. Go ahead. No, I think that it's, it's, uh, I read these like Jeremiah probably does. Well, I know he does. Um, you know, all in Christ shall be made alive is referring to the just and the unjust. It's what the scriptures all, Jesus is going to raise the just and the unjust. So all, all die in Adam. All shall be made alive in Christ, the just and the unjust. He's, it, the scriptures re, are replete with this. So Daniel 12, uh, who's raised there? The just and the unjust. Uh, John 5, 28, who's raised? Some to everlasting life, some to the just and the unjust. In Acts 28, what does he say? What does Paul say? He's the God of the living and the dead. And he shall raise the just and the unjust. There's one, it's one resurrection. It's not parceled out by a thousand years. It's the just and the unjust will be raised. And then the books will be open and they're going to be, uh, and that's the end of that. Death will be thrown into the lake of fire. Done. End of story. No complications. That's it. And that to me, the simplicity is is, is why I think amillennialism or postmillennialism. Um, postmillennialism is just uh, amillennialism on steroids. So it, it's just, um, it, but, but the, both views share the same basic, uh, basic structure. Um they're, they're both not neither premillennial, and and the appeal to it is 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 just the the series of events. Uh, Jesus came, Jesus saw, Jesus conquered, Jesus ascended. All power and authority is His. Endure to the end and be faithful to His word. Endure tribulation, which you're going to have, by the way. 
and uh, remain faithful unto death and you will enter into heaven. You will be with Christ and rule and reign with Christ and his kingdom and his rule and reign until he destroys what he has the keys of in his hand, death and the grave. And that's it. And I love it. I love it. I'm like, that's it. It's that's it. It's it's so appealing. And uh, I I don't have to go through all of these charts and graphs and and hypothetical typologies of quadruple fulfillments and progressive debacles of different types of gradualisms that occur in a sense, in a way, in the third sense of the second sense that was meant by the third text when I quoted the fifth one. I, I, I don't have to do any of that anymore. And I'm so thankful. So anyway, that's it. All right, gentlemen, that was a fun debate, a great audience Q&A. And so I do appreciate how engaged our awesome audience is. For these debates, Dr. Sam Frost, Phelan McFallon, thanks to the both of you for giving us a debate to remember on a, a solid topic, the, uh, the millennium. So, gentlemen, any quick final words, final thoughts before we wrap it up? No, Donnie, thanks, I love buddy. you. Brian, I love you. And I plan on love engaging you too, with you it's more. Been a pleasure. Merry Christmas. Um, yes, sir. And this has been great. And Donnie, look forward to both of you doing this again or whatever. Um, of course. Amen. Yep, yep, yep. I love it. Thank you. Merry both. Christmas, brothers. Merry Appreciate Christmas. you doing this. Sam, Merry you get Christmas. out of here. <laughs> yeah. Feel it. God bless. Go God bless, Sam. God bless. Yes. <laughs> and then get a good sleep, Sam. Yep. So to the audience, thank you so much for tuning in. God bless. Standing for Truth is out.